This is a story about friendship, about uniting, working together, persevering in the face of adversity, and struggling to achieve a common goal. A story from a time before the internet became what it is today, and how a few viral hit videos brought together an online community of low-budget filmmakers who shared the same perseverance, drive, and passion. In 2004, director Travis Bowles and his closest friends set out to make a short film that pondered the hypothetical existence of real lightsabers. And several years later, they would follow it up with a sequel. A third installment was discussed, but never came to be. And fans of the first two have been wondering ever since what happened. This is the story of three in the afternoon and six in the morning. What is it? Your father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. Not as clumsy or random as a blaster. The year is probably 92. We'd have to Google it. The year that the widescreen VHS tapes hit Suncoast. The original Star Wars trilogy on video. One last time. Growing up on the original trilogy, the iconic images and, and, and catchphrases from Empire and Return of the Jedi are forever burned into my brain. Yeah, I, I grew up with a Betamax in my room um, and I had Star Wars on Betamax. My parents had recorded it off of HBO, I guess. Some of my earliest memories of watching movies was, was A New Hope. Yeah, I was just blown away by the movie. So yeah, it's kind of always been in my childhood. It's a, part of everything I've always known. My first memory of Star Wars is my mom telling me that the first movie I ever saw theatrically was Jedi. Now I was like two when that happened, so I don't remember it at all. The first time I ever saw it was my sixth grade choir teacher showed it to us, A New Hope. I don't know how many of the other kids were engaged with it, but I was like, Whew. I was like so into it. And I remember going home and, and telling my parents about it. And they were like, oh yeah, Star Wars. You know, and of course they, they went and saw it on dates and stuff. I felt betrayed. I was like, how have you known about this and not told me about it, you know? A little short for a stormtrooper. Huh? Just one of those things, like growing up, I had the toys. I was always playing with the, with the lightsabers that came out of their arms. So they actually like extended that kind of thing. Now your children can relive our great space battles or collect our wonderful Star Wars companions. Between that and watching Ghostbusters and then watching like, I, at some point I saw some sort of making of Ghostbusters. And I know that between those two things, that's where I went, oh, okay, they make these things and really just got bit. Yeah, Star Wars will always have a place in my heart. My dad in particular and my parents generally are uh, pretty big on sci-fi, so I grew up with Star Wars in the home. You know, we had the VHS tapes, we cracked them out and watched them with some frequency and always enjoyed them, but it never really turned into an obsession for me until the prequel started coming out. When the trailer for The Phantom Menace came out, that's when I was like, oh my god, this is cool. And then not only did that suddenly reignite a lot of interest in Star Wars personally, but it also was the beginning of me trying to figure out how to do visual effects. And uh, like, oh, I, I gotta figure out how to make a lightsaber. I got that, that Darth Maul fighting Obi-Wan shot in the trailer. It's so cool. I gotta try to recreate that. How can I do this? While the world was anticipating the release of a new Star Wars film, a group of lifelong friends was forming at a high school in East Texas. We'd been living in Los Angeles. My dad worked at KNBC. 26-year-old Travis Bowles and Tyler has been fascinated with cameras since he was a child. My dad bought this shoulder mount VHS camera. I picked it up and we were shooting. I am back here. Coming soon to a theater near you. Shoe Gum Tyler, the feature film. Shoe Gum Tyler was a thriving franchise. You set the camera up on a table, get yourself a big wide shot. Yeah, I'm cool, yeah! It began a life of production for me. I began a constant state of making something that has gone through my entire life. And once that happened, um, it was game on. My dad took a job to come back home to East Texas to work at a TV station in Tyler, Texas. 
I was furious about it. I didn't even know what to do with myself. I was so mad. I attended Chapel Hill High School and met most of the friends that I would have well into my 30s. I went to high school with Corey and Travis. They were a few years under me. There's a visual media class that year that Corey and I were in. So we'd get a chance to shoot and shoot together. We didn't really start hanging out until like a year after high school. We were all part of a group of friends. There was about maybe 10 or 12 of us that were very close and spent a ton of time together. I've actually known Corey and Jim Davis since I was maybe five or six. I met Trav, would have been my sophomore year in high school. Since the art class was full, they put me in theater and I just happened to enjoy it. So I stuck with it for a while. You know, I hung out with Travis and Pruitt. We were all like kind of best friends there in high school. And so we played West End Star Wars games and we played Dungeons and Dragons. The first time Travis introduced himself to me, we very much were cut from the same cloth. Like it, I could tell like he's a very similar type person but it was one of those things where I was being a cool senior and he was like a, a freshman. So when he just came up to me and was like, hey, uh, you're Pruitt, right? I, I, uh, Pro, Pro, which was our theater teacher, Pro tells me that we're, uh, we're cut from the same cloth and he has his hand out to me. And it was just one of those moments I couldn't resist. I just look at his hand and look at him and go, no, we're not. And just kind of turn around and walk away. <laughs> Cause it was like the presumption. But like later on, it was like, hey man, you know, I, I quickly was like, I was joking. I can be a bit of an ass, sorry. So I couldn't work at my dad's TV station because of nepotism, which they took very seriously. And so I went to TJC for a while. They did not have a film program. So really, instead of going to film school in the years where I would have been at film school, what I ended up doing is out of high school, I was shooting weddings. I was helping some videographers here in town who'd pick up the phone and knew they could count on me to help them with a wedding or a commercial. Just did a lot of shooting and just, just, work, just worked, you know, and just learned it on the streets just became a videographer. Throughout their formative years, Travis and his friends produced a variety of short films ranging from gross out comedies to small scale action sequences. Fanboys Productions was just, that was before Ernie Klein, I believe, wrote that script. And so I've never seen that movie. I wrote a script for a, it was gonna be a feature. And then basically I completed the idea at about 40 pages and it was called Fanboys. This is, this is day three. Uh, we're on set in front of the uh, shooters, and my I'm really impressed with my cast. They're all they don't complain at all. I'd really like you to put that away. <laughs> it's basically I've never seen Footloose. I somehow reached up into the ether and plucked the plot of Footloose out of thin air. It was one of a dozen times in my life where I was way more into an idea than. A, I should have been, and B, anybody else around me was. All my friends thought my movie sucked. And if you watch the, if you watch the footage, they're constantly telling me how much this sucks. This movie sucks. <laughs> this movie does suck. Comics, blue, 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 blue. <laughs> I'm gonna kick your ass. Okay. Now we move on to Pete's stuff. We're done, gentlemen. I have another shut up, don't I? Yes, you do. Travis doesn't know what he's doing. I like to make movies and eat lots of yogurt. Travis is a hack. But it set a tone for, it was the first thing we'd all done together. We were all working in a movie theater together of all places. Trav got hired. Pruitt was the assistant manager, I believe. There was a point about six months in where I think the entire staff, except for the manager, was just our group of friends. So we essentially ran, ran that theater and it was super fun, but not necessarily the best working environment to get work done. Yeah, we all we all became good friends. I mean, it was, it was pretty much like one family working there, so to speak. This is probably the most fun job any of us are ever gonna have. Yeah. Well, I guess you have to make your own fun around here. I moved here three years ago and I still can't get over how plain this town is. I know what you mean. Aaron and I first met when I moved back to East Texas from Austin. I had been working at a head shop and I was held at gunpoint. We were robbed twice. I quit the head shop a few weeks later and then just kind of freaked out. You know, I wasn't making anything and so I moved back home with my folks. He came to one of my theater classes at TJC. It was like very spur of the moment. He was like, I'm gonna hold an audition for a short film and it's gonna be tomorrow. Who could show up for that? And a lot of people 
already had plans and, and couldn't do it. The young lady in the front row held her hand up and then she was the only one that showed up to the audition. So I got the part. And that's how I met all of these guys. So I put her in the zombie movie and I put her in you know, the stuff and we were dating. And then we were engaged for a long time. Got married in 2014. And Kingsley, our daughter, was born the following year. And yeah. Did he tell you the zombie story? That's one of the things about Tyler was I figured out at a certain point that I could get away with whatever the hell I wanted, you know. Tyler PD and I were always pretty square. In fact, the zombie movie we shot with Aaron. The cruiser pulled up. There's literally someone on top of me and there's fake blood all over. And we're right by the street and cops just kind of roll up, you know, and they're like, what's good? What it? We're like, oh, <laughs> we're making a movie. And I'm like, well, sir, uh, she's being eaten by that zombie right there. And there's blood that's that's carol syrup on her neck. He was like, all right, hold on just a second. And he's like pointing his dash cam at it so he can show you know, the headquarters. And they're just like, cool, let's get a picture. <laughs> like. And he's like, all right, y'all be careful. Meanwhile, the Star Wars prequel trilogy was inspiring fans all over the world in a newly emerging online fan film community. So you've got Phantom Menace in 1999, and then pretty shortly thereafter, like the next few years, it's just boom, boom, boom. Everybody got their cameras out and started trying to make stuff. You know, that came along when a lot of younger kids for the first time had the ability to really do that. You know, like everybody could have their own cameras and actually have a computer that could do editing and visual effects and kids could pick this stuff up in large part because of, you know, tutorials and stuff online. And that really wasn't possible any time before when the prequels started coming out. And so it was just a, just at the right time and everyone was feeling very inspired, I think. And, uh, and that really kicked it off. So there is a website called theforce.net. There was no YouTube, and so the simple task of hosting the video online was a big deal. And so theforce.net offered that if you made something noteworthy enough to be approved and, and hosted on the site. Back then, things like theforce.net and iFilm, they were the gateways. People would send them VHS tapes, because even then, creating a digital file was size prohibitive. Danger, danger, danger. Mandalorian on the loose. Jedi Hunter, we made for the fun of it, not caring if there was going to be another contest, not caring if we were making money. It was just a funny idea and we wanted to see it made. And of course, that's the one that you know won all the awards in the next year, but we didn't make it for that. We just made it to amuse ourselves. What does I be my master? It's a disaster, Skywalker, what after? What if we can be turned to the dark side? Yes, he be a powerful ally. You know, why don't you just talk? All the other robots talk. It's not like it's that hard. Well, you're going to have to come down here and get it yourself. You're on Dantooine? You took your drink all the way to Dantooine before you drank it? That's 45 parsecs away. Of course it was watered down. So I was frequenting this site and its uh, forums, which had a lot of activity with everybody trying to make fan films. I was in sort of a rivalry with a dude named Michael Scott, who went by Dorkman on the forums. Eventually, there was a uh, contest on there about rotoscoping sabers and doing saber effects, which I had already been doing uh, quite a bit of, and so we were contentiously participating in that. 
And then uh, eventually on this uh, fan film's forum, they decided to have a lightsaber choreography contest. By the time that came around, Dorkman and myself were uh, on decent terms and uh, getting along and saying, you know, we should get together and actually fight each other in real life as sort of a, a funny homage to all of our friends in this uh, fan films forum. And so that's what we did, and we, you know, really uh, did our best and, and put everything we could into it. <laughs> Try to make some decent choreography, give some attention to the editing and the design and uh, the whole sequence and everything, and put it out. Did okay. Won the contest. Yay, hurrah. And it got hosted on, on there, and uh, everybody, it was well received at the time, but um, it would be several years later when it really sort of got second legs and then kind of went viral and exploded on, you know, all the, all the websites of, of the time. And then, of course, when YouTube came around, then a guy named Maniac Mike uploaded it himself. So by the time I came around to going, oh, this YouTube thing, it was already there with millions of views. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. Well, you know what? Maniac Mike uh, can keep that view count going. I, I like knowing what, it, what the closest to the real number actually is. And so I haven't uploaded that. I think what really started to make it feel real to me was how often I would bump into people who were like, oh yeah, I know that video. Yeah, I've seen that. That thing's great. You know, and it's like, oh, okay, cool. So especially in real life, when I moved to Los Angeles, I was getting um, recognized a lot, actually, <laughs> which was really sort of surreal. I really don't, in my imagination, think of it as being, you know, so viral that I'd be any any flavor of uh, internet famous for that. But uh, then I was like, oh wow, I guess it's I guess it's real. Those numbers really are people, you know. <laughs>fan film scene like really exploded when the Star Wars prequel started coming out. You've got stuff like um, Kevin Rubio's Troops, you know, which is like a cops parody in the Star Wars universe. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? And I think that really kind of kicked the door in on like, oh wow, he did some like pretty decent special effects in that. Hey, it's actually a funny concept that's well executed. Troops. I think it had to be busted up into four or five sections, you know, to be able to download it. And it would take a day just to get troops and its distribution on the Internet. The fact that it melted servers across the country, it really showed that the Internet was going to be a platform for distributing content. You could share something with some friends or share some tapes and it might be seen by a small audience. But if something going out worldwide that fast was impossible and troops showed that it was possible and it, it really changed the game. Before that, like way back right after Star Wars came out, you know, you had like hardware wars. Get us out of here. Take it easy, kid. It's only a movie. Another parody, so comedy was a big aspect of it. Maybe in no small part because legally that keeps it very unambiguous in terms of it being a parody, you know? Not so much the sort of fan films that are trying to really play in the sandbox. I think that stuff started really happening when the prequels were coming out. Hi, I'm Ryan Weber, and this is my tutorial showing you my method for creating lightsaber glows in Adobe After Effects. I put out a lightsaber tutorial, which the After Effects one, if I'm not mistaken, was the first tutorial for how to do lightsabers in After Effects that was on the internet. Force.net, I don't know how I found it because I know I was watching fan films. I don't, it was a, it's a chicken or an egg thing. I, I really don't know how, whether I saw a Ryan Weaver lightsaber tutorial before I got to force.net or whether I got to force.net and saw a Ryan Weaver lightsaber tutorial. I think it came from wanting to investigate how to use After Effects because we were all pirating like crazy. And it was like, oh, well, let's see what I can do in here. The first one he did, it was a shot of Qui-Gon. Select the pen tool from the toolbox, make sure the solids layer is selected, and now we're going to go ahead and uh, draw our saber right on there using the pen tool. And he's going, all right, so boop, 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 and keyframes, and boop, 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 boop. And man, I was on fire. My socks were on fire. I was electrified. I was like, shut up. All right, and I'm in After Effects, and I'm going boop, 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 boop. I remember sitting over there hanging out and him, him working on that, and he and I and Corey kind of trying to figure out, you know, making little tweaks and trying to make her get everything lined up perfectly. 
that's where the engine for three really began. That's where we're like, oh, okay, all right, well, I could do a lightsaber in this computer. Holy shit. Now, I don't think there's any doubt about it. I'd be one in a second. So, no doubt, you just take the quick and easy path. Absolutely. That's sad, dude. Man, if people have real lightsabers, they're just gonna sit around and meditate all day. Yeah, man, you start slicing into people's houses. So, I was living in Austin. I was working at this head shop. I had this really scary experience. I was surrounded by really weird people. And I was living in a one-bedroom apartment that I couldn't afford, especially after I quit Planet K. And so while I knew I still had it, I would have these lovely sort of um, quiet afternoons on my uh, on my patio all to myself. The White Stripes had put out Elephant and he was, you know, the, the, they're psycho about the number three. And I would listen to some interview with him talking about the number three and I couldn't get it off my mind. Things in threes and, you know, you're obviously you're reading Sid Field's screenplay, you know, and, and you know, rule of thirds and all these, these threes are spinning around your head. Everything seems to be able to so easily be broken into three pieces. I had a thing for where three friends were gonna do something. I hit a point by the time I was really writing three and trying to get it into shape where I was starting to realize how mad I was at my friends being shitty to me. And I think that that theme is very much, it's a big part of the first two minutes of three. And it's a big part of the early drafts of three, where they're really very mean to one another. And most of that survives. I don't hate Star Wars, and that doesn't enter into it. You do the same thing over and over in this game. You super jump over there. It's force jump. You force jump over there. You force smack each other in the head, and then you force do it all over again. Well, that's why we're not letting you play. You better let me play or I'll force kick you out of my house. And the way it comes off in the movie is as a Kevin Smith kind of a thing where everybody's giving each other shit and everybody, you know, we got a little foul language early on, unless you know we're, you know, this isn't for little kids. Why don't you go get the door, asshole? What did you like better, Jedi or the Empire Strikes Back? Empire. Blasphemy. And I just remember it's kind of like, it's like a weird clerk's thing, but staying home and you just you just get a, a package. The coolest thing about Star Wars is the lightsabers. Like Star Wars is whatever and you know, the ships and the plot and the story and all that sort of stuff. But what really I think we loved and then every little kid, right? You watch Star Wars, you walk out of the movie, you want a lightsaber. Like, who hasn't thought about that? What Star Wars fan has not thought that thing? They look just like the toys. But they're heavier. More elegant weapon for more civilized. You cut that out. And that's like the indelible thing that makes Star Wars, I think, Star Wars. Like everything else in the movie is, you know, is, is a part of the movie. But what really makes Star Wars sort of like sing as a kid is that first time Luke turns on the lightsaber with Obi-Wan in Obi-Wan's little hut. I mean, you're little brain just explodes. I mean, that really was just kind of just feeding back into the short is just, let's just use that, you know? And so Travis came up with the idea of like, okay, well, what if we do a thing with, with that? What if we do a thing where we're all friends and we get lightsabers and then what happens? That's why I was like, no, I love that because there's not a lot of, you know, we can just go anywhere we want with it. We're not really beholden to anything other than, you know, kind of the physics of a lightsaber. And that's all we really have to be beholden to. I mean, come on. They can't really. Turn it off! Turn it off! But we also get to still talk about Star Wars and our, our kind of nerdy knowledge of it. And there's a big scoop of Ghostbusters going there of something fantastic in the real world that we are all just going to go ahead and accept is true. A full torso apparition, and it's real and you're all just going to have to deal with the fact that ghosts are real, okay? You're all just gonna have to live with it. And the, and the story goes from there. And even in the, in the context of Ghostbusters, the Ghostbusters are looked at like, you know, like they're nuts for much of it. What are you supposed to be, some kind of a cosmonaut? So our characters are gonna be kind of thrust into this. How it really came around was knowing I could make lightsabers, knowing that I wanted to have this 
three structure okay they start here and then there's this middle bit where they kind of deal with it and then there's this showdown where three becomes six becomes you know like 12 when they all haul their lightsabers out everything multiplies and, and then my showstopper was oh they're all going to change their colors and you'll have this sort of galaxy of color by the end of it there's these three guys and then what do you know three you know girls show up and they don't get it and that's kind of the joke and it's kind of a cheap joke but it also like is another thing it's like oh the reality is they don't get it and they're pissed and you just sort of have to deal with that they're all red what the hell am i supposed to do with a red lightsaber what are we supposed to do with three red lightsabers oh my god i feel like it is the way girls might react at first you kind of don't know what to do with the lightsaber and boys know what to do and the reason why I say that is just raising a little boy, he immediately knew what to do with a Nerf gun. Like I didn't have to teach him how to hold it, how to shoot it, how to play with it. It was like innate, you know, of course everybody can argue different viewpoints and that's fine. For me, it was like a kind of natural sort of thing. Like where boys pick it up and they know what to do and they're wanting to play and they're wanting to roughhouse a little bit. And girls are kind of not like that. At least these characters are not. They're curious, they wanna know. At the same time, they're more just kind of like figuring it out. And there's nothing wrong with like taking your time with something before you go straight into, you know, cutting a tree limb off or whatever. And then that payoff of one of them leaving. Corey's gone. He's what? And turning to the dark side. <laughs> Before we were making three, I'll never forget bringing them over to the house and being like, all right, I want to do this. And I'm not sure what it's called yet. They didn't have a title right away. I was like, but this is what we're doing. When he came up with the idea and he had the script, it looked like something we could shoot. It looked like something we could shoot that was, you know, sort of small in scale enough that we could sort of handle it. The logistics of figuring out how to do everything, whether it was, you know, where we were going to shoot it, who was going to be in it, how were we going to do the visual effects? None of us knew anything about visual effects. We didn't have any experience in After Effects at the time. We knew of rotoscoping because we were all, you know, huge film buffs. But, like, we didn't know if any of this shit was going to work. So we just kind of went with it and was like, well, we'll figure it out. I, of course, you know, being in martial arts, and I think I was a black belt, but already out of martial arts, but still very much in kind of fighting shape. I would love to help choreograph this and, like, kind of, you know, who doesn't want to show off, right? I remember me and Pruitt out in the driveway of Trav's house working out the choreography for the fights. I really had fun reading the script. I zoomed through it really fast and the dialogue was great. And I was like, I, I want to be a part of this. This sounds really fun. Like, you know, it's not like he handed it to me and said, I want you to be in this. He handed it to me and said, I wrote a script. I want you to read it. And so I'm reading it and I'm just like, I don't know if he's gonna put me in this or not, but even if I'm just holding lights in the background, I wanna be a part of it, you know? And so then when he was like, yeah, I want you to be that girl. I'm like, yeah, okay. We all went to South Padre Island on a vacation. My great aunt had a condo in Padre. We all got really wasted and watched the sunset. And I was like, I just really wanna make this thing. And me and Pruitt and Corey, I showed them this video. That was where I kind of wooed them into agreeing to it. My memory of it is that at first they hesitated and then I convinced them on that trip with kind of a proof of concept video. Travis had already done some tests, some lightsaber stuff. So he showed us kind of that, some early After Effects sort of work. And so he showed us that and was like, yeah, let's do it. This sounds awesome. We were pretty much like, yeah, let's do this. I have an idea. So basically because we were kind of meh on, on the prequels, I just remember there being a focus on, look, this isn't a Star Wars fan film. We all love lightsabers. And like, what would it be like to get a real lightsaber in modern day? And that's what I loved about what he was making is he was he took one element of it and he twisted it into something completely different. And I was like, that's something that's interesting to me. That's something new and that's fun to watch. You guys are fighting? Yes, we're fighting. Fighting is not the answer. Actually, fighting is the answer. Yeah, in this game, fighting is the answer. That's why I don't like this game. Whether intentional or unintentional, I think about the first two minutes of three a lot because I, it says a lot about my relationships throughout my late teens and my 20s. 
where clearly we want to spend time together. Clearly we like one another, but we don't treat each other very well. We don't take care of one another and our relationship is more tenuous than it looks right now where I'm in my bathroom. I'm super comfortable. You're at my house, but you're being a dick to me and I'm fine with it. And that's toxic. You know, it's played for laughs because it should be. The colors are very bright. I made sure that, you know, Prue and Corey are wearing these bright colors and I'm in this bright bathroom. And so there's something very primary. They're in a triangle shape. There's That's completely deliberate. That was used as a poster early on was this early image of them on this couch. And I think that's another reason I'm glad I'm dressed that way in three and six, because my character hates himself. This is someone who is struggling with his relationships with his friends and with himself and he's not taking care of himself he is living the way that he's allowed himself to be treated by the people close to him and even if even and especially if the people close to him love him and want the best for him he is not living up to that and he is in fact not his best and owning it right and kind of wearing it like a bathrobe. All I'm saying is we might not seriously hurt each other if we mess up while we're fighting. Sparring. Who said anything about fighting? Sparring. Me, I am. I'm saying something about fighting. Pruitt, once he got done working at the movie theater, he got hired at a hospital as a driver. I was a pharmacy tech for 20 years. So I was that was the scrubs I wear to work. And he'd just be up at the hospital. He's going here, he's going there. He's making IVs. He's filling syringes. He was always, you know, this just proves very hard worker and has been doing that for a very long time and really knows what he's doing. When we were thinking about three different people in three different distinct looks, I was like, well, why don't I just wear my scrubs? They kind of just look like a uniform. They're obviously known, but when you're wielding a lightsaber next to it, you know, it kind of works. We discussed that and that was pretty much the thing. It was like, well, if I'm wearing scrubs, that tells a story without saying a word. It's obvious that I do a thing. Corey was a Chili's waiter because I was a Chili's waiter at one point. So that's why that got written in. It's three distinct character archetype things that you see in modern day, but when you put a lightsaber in our hands, it still looks okay. I think, you know, from the beginning, I was always going to play the villain of the shorts. I think, you know, there's always been just a part of me and we talked about it as friends and stuff about like, you know, would you rather be the superhero or the super villain? And I think there was always an appeal just for me of like, you know, there's, I, I understand why Magneto is like Magneto, you know, it's why you love the villains of the stories, right? The villains have some of the best backstories and they get to do some of the coolest stuff. But in science fiction, you normally take like some technology, push it forward in the future and extrapolate how the human condition is struggling with this thing, right? So what I love is three and six are like reverse engineering of that. You take a technology from science fiction and put it in the real world and see how we would grapple without the real world consequences being known. But it's still the same thing. You're struggling with the human condition based around this technology and how it changes people. And so like, that's what I always thought of like that there was this actual like really cool thing going on underneath the the silliness and the lightsabers and all that like no this is the story that we're telling is you know these things can change people and at the end of the day it's just a representation of power it's the allure of the dark side right it's the undercurrent of all the movies you know that you're given this great power how easy it is to turn that towards doing bad things in the world doing negative things in the world and not striving toward the light you know the whole fight and crux of the movie right is all of the good jedi trying to disavow themselves of these urges to not fall to the dark and the temptation of the dark and I think that's if there's you know a um, interesting philosophical thing going on in star wars it's sort of that part right that you always have these knights trying to do good and trying to do right and it's so seemingly easy for them to sort of fall and become taken by their power is it possible to learn this power? Not from a Jedi. I don't know, it always seemed to me to be interesting and also just sort of funny um, that that would be like an interesting way to think about it, that, oh yeah, you just immediately go and start doing whatever you want with this like ultra weapon. But it, it's sort of a weird line there, right? Between using it for good and using it for evil. And then you can look at it and who's evil, who's good, who's whatever, I mean, there's, the moral rightness of their position can be questioned, I think, by all sorts of stuff in that movie. How does power change you? Does power corrupt absolutely? Or 
you know, can some people resist? And so, you know, it, I think that we have a nice, uh, to, to borrow the D&D alignment system, we have a nice evil, neutral, and good outcomes based on the three main characters. I think we always wanted to leave the endings ambiguous because I think that's sort of the best endings, you know? where We don't wrap up the story in a bow. Like, leave the audience wanting more was sort of something we always sort of thought would be cool to put at the end of the movie. Next time, try not to lose it. Yes, Master. This weapon is your life. As a teenager, when you're watching it, right, when it comes out, it, you sort of see that, okay, this is a, partly it's entertainment, whatever, it's a toy commercial, it's all the bits and parts that George Lucas has sort of put together for this thing. And so that sort of cynical viewpoint of it, I think, is just sort of baked into sort of growing up in that, in that time. We saw it as sort of like, oh, okay, well, it's another, you know, another thing for George to do to make the Star Wars franchise move forward. Star Wars electronic lightsabers. Which side will you choose? The side of Anakin Skywalker or the dark side of Darth Tyrannus? I remember the thing about clones and one of the things that led to three was I was buying toys again when I was making a little bit of, of money. I was buying toy lightsabers. I was buying them. And I'm well into my early 20s. You know, I don't give a shit. Now you can wield the power of a true Jedi master. Building the lightsabers was super fun because we had to figure out, you know, how do we take these 20 or $30 plastic for all intents and purposes pieces of shit that are going to break as soon as we hit anything with them and make them somewhat functional. The force is in your hands with Star Wars electronic lightsabers, each sold separately. By the time I had moved home, I was very familiar with PVC pipe, very familiar with couplings. And I'm a big Mr. Sands Theater 3000 fan. At a certain point, when I started making my own money and getting on eBay, I built all three robots for Mr. Sands Theater. I've tracked down all the parts. I built Crow and Tom and Gypsy. I knew how to go into Lowe's and, and do some damage, right? I, I knew my way around it. Hi, I'm Travis Bowles. And uh, today I'd like to show you how I did the prop uh, lightsabers for three in the afternoon with no money and really no resources except for a Home Depot and the toys that you buy at Toys R Us. Ended up getting uh, a couple of the, the force effects lightsabers for the hero lightsabers and then using the kind of crappy plastic ones as like, you know, secondaries. They were chunky and they were modular. They came apart in all these pieces. I had a little bit of money and we spent about a hundred bucks on saber props because I had to get them for six people. But I knew that in my movie, only two people were going to fight and myself and the three girls were really only going to have lightsabers that were mostly just for show. They weren't going to be fought with, but Corey and Pruitt's lightsaber, I knew were going to get a lot of wear and tear. You know, I remember buying the Mace Windu one and the Obi-Wan one and bringing them home and being like, okay, do it, do it, it. Gotta unscrew it out. Battery compartment's empty. And this kind of falls out the bottom, then you got the cap, and then the lightsaber kind of has this like inner cap, and then it's crazy glued to the actual collapsible braid itself. So you kind of get that to walk and then it comes out. I remember going up to Lowe's with the lightsaber itself and just testing different things to see what I could fit in there without rattling, and they had these I guess it's one inch steel couplings for no shit. And they had the thread so I can put a PVC cap on a steel coupling that got a little rubber grommet on the inside like a little O-ring. And this is going to drop right down into your lightsaber, okay? And that's gonna click in hard. And I remember it would grip the battery spring at the bottom, it would sit on it and get it. So then I, I started with PVC pipe, but then I realized the CPVC pipe is stronger and got that in there. And what ended up happening was you had a very chunky lightsaber with a very narrow prop blade that is crazy bendy. And of course, I covered my ass in the movie by saying, you know, they look just like the toys, which is part of the point of the movie. And some people say, you know, they watch three and they go, the hilts are too big. The hilts are too big. Well, you know, that's kind of the point. Remember, you can either point the money hose at it or you can use your own creativity. We should treat these things like guns. You know, only turn them on when you're going to use them and off whenever you're done. And we should, uh, we should say something when we switch them on so we can do it together, you know? We had a blast shooting three. It was like the big hangout of our group at that time. And we, we all came together and we were all working together and trying to figure this complex thing out. I mean, shooting something like that with all these people and stuff, but we, you know, we don't really have a crew. It's just sort of 
us acting right now, showing these kids what, uh, how it's done. You know. It's hard whenever you work on these lower budget projects to uh, carry the script. It's good. It's good, you know, and I enjoy it, but seasoned actor like me, yeah. it's hard to work with unexperienced. <laughs> Those guys are like brothers to me, and they always have been and always will be. So really all Travis had to do was say, hey, you wanna do this? And I was like, yes, of course. I mean, I almost would have been offended if they didn't ask me to be a part of it, you know, because we all hung out so much at that point in our lives. My dad was in the Marine Corps. I remember having to persuade him even at the age of 17, to let me stay out past 11 o'clock. Pruitt's dad and my dad grew up together. Pruitt was the only person that could ever talk my dad into letting me stay out past my curfew because he trusted his dad. We're just doing nerdy filming things. It's not like we're up to no good. If I remember correctly, I think Pruitt had to like pick me up and take me home just to like prove that we were being honest. Everybody was on the same page and got it for the first night of three, which was when we shot the last act of three. Once the girls show up on, that was all the first night of production right there. There were no roles aside from really Travis as the director and, and our, our cast. We, you know, obviously we had the script kind of broke it up so we knew per day or per shoot what we were going to shoot that that particular afternoon or, or evening. It was all a mix of everybody doing doing lots of little stuff. Just whoever wants to pitch in to help, you know, the more the merrier. It was fun because, you know, we just filmed at the tennis courts where Trav's family lived and we just went down there in the middle of the night and filmed and nobody really messed with us. I want to say that Travis's mom might have made us like croissants with chocolate in them or something so that we could like have something to eat because, you know, you don't have like craft services and things like that. As with most of the things that we shot, we had no real official permission to be there. I just remember us being like, all right, we're going down to the tennis courts, you know, and we're carrying all this gear in the dark. I had all the gear. I borrowed the lights. b and shit, you know what I mean? Like I'm not hauling 1Ks out. It was all prosumer videography equipment. Just me and Pruitt and our friend Jesse and, and the girls that had, you know, Gina and everyone that showed up and just everyone trying to work together to figure out the blocking and how we're gonna move around this thing and keep everything straight while we're all sort of hanging out and having fun at the same time. Like different nights, there was like different people that he used to know coming that I'd never met that would like be a part of it for one night each. Like one guy was helping with our sound. So it was like, you know, people that were just old friends coming to, and that's exactly the way these things are usually done. And that's, that's how you get these things done is old friends come together to help for free and you know you'll notice that's the roughest stuff we kind of had our shit together by the middle and and then especially at the front that's why the movie kind of gets worse as it goes along at least as far as a, a on a technical level it was a ton of improv a ton of just dicking around and not shooting and hanging out and cracking each other up action dude God, that's a little <laughs> that's a little basic <laughs> <Slowly. laughs> action Cut, cut the camera. Uh, action. <laughs> Come on, we're almost done. Shoot it. Three, here Three. we go. Action. <laughs> you know, I didn't have an AC, I didn't have an AD, I didn't, you know, this was, this was me doing it. So I had my script printed out and then I would write all over it. I had a shot list and I just scratched things off as we were going and I had it in my head that I know I have to have that, I know I have to have that, and then I just make it all work later. And then I realized after that first night that I didn't need any help. And then we came back the next night and did great and had a great night and we were up all fucking night. It's the last night of the uh, lightsaber film. It's approximately 3.22 in the morning. How do you feel on your last night of shooting? Uh, right now I'm... I'm tired, <clears throat> but I'm excited to get to the fighting. And uh, no, we only have probably like another hour, hour and a half to go. Chris Whitlock, sound designer on the film. Uh, how are you feeling about right now? I'm really fucking tired, dude. Shit. What hopes do you have for the final product? I hope that it fucking sounds good. <laughs> Dialogue, music, everything. All right, Travis. 
Travis Wells, director of this film, writer of this film, producer of this film. I have not been frustrated until this point. Why I, is that? I don't know. I do know, but it's complicated. But we're going to finish this movie and this fight's going to look like a million bucks. How do you feel about the project so far? I think we've done a tremendous job. I think that everyone has given endlessly to this, this idea and has just stuck it out. And I, to everyone involved, thank you endlessly from the bottom of my heart for making this come to life in front of me. And we finished the second night with the fight with Pruitt and Corey because we knew that was going to be like the big, like, mm. so it's Jesse pulling me in a wheelchair back and forth while they do this fight and we did it like eight times and we have like these foam mattress pads you know like and they're falling on that you know and Corey kicks them and all this and in the meantime Aaron and other people are just sitting on them you know and because we're on a fucking tennis course there's nowhere to sit <laughs> No kicking! I didn't know we had started kicking. We've started kicking. These are all things you do in your early 20s when you're indestructible and don't have to sleep. Look, look, we can work this out. We just did. I'm gonna kill that one first. Training up the girls, it was a lot of fun, like, just trying to get them at least looking like they're badasses. Like, no, no, you gotta stand like this. This is a proper fighting stance. Like, I was doing a lot of that. Like, no, put your feet like this. Now kind of bend here. You know, at the time, like, we obviously were inspired by Ryan versus Dorkman. It was a big influence. So it was kind of like, you know, watching their fights and, like, how they do it. And, you know, it never helped choreograph a fight scene before. And so, like, trying to make it look real without killing each other. We're fighting and uh, block the blade and it snaps and goes right over one of our heads. I was like, oh crap, you know, cause man, that would have been the end of uh, filming for a couple days as I have a, you know, a horizontal welt on my forehead. We broke a ton of blades. We had a, a box or a bag or something just full of spray painted PVC pipes. Cause we break one, just have to switch it out real quick and, and keep going. Good job, Jess. <laughs> Drop that it's good for the documentary. Here we go, we are rolling. Ready? Action. Shit. <laughs> I bailed that one out because I just saw I was like, I ain't getting up for that. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's been phased right into it. There. Oh, 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 shit. I didn't actually mean to push off. <laughs> so it's all these singles, 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 singles. It's a little red. It doesn't color match the rest of the movie. That's there's we white balance at some point, like in the midst of that. So that shot where I look at the lightsaber and then can't believe that I got the color to change and then look up. That's a one -er that I was like, hey, come get this real quick and make sure we just have this. And then I'll never forget cutting it being like, Jesus, Lord Christ, if I didn't have that shot, I can't get to the end. I can't go bing, bing, bing. And I barely got it. That's another big thing is while you're there, you're going to feel like an asshole for being like, look, I got to get this. Let's do it another time. Can we get one more? I'm tired. Are you ready to go? I'm sorry. All the directing I've had the opportunity to do, that was really the war of it, was how much time can I fight for and, and validate? And then also Corey running away, which is the very last thing we did, and that was just me and him. And I just had everybody move to one side of the tennis court and we just knocked that out real fast. The lighting of the last shot where Corey turns on his red lightsaber, that was, we had a great time with that because it was just kind of like, no, 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 let's go, get a, let's go get a clamp light, let's get a red bulb. I was like, all right, Tyler, when he lifts the lightsaber, you, you turn the light up and it, it cues this light. It's just kind of like, shh, and like throwing a splash light up on his face and finally getting that timing perfect. So it looks like light comes up, you know, from below. That was a hoot. I remember the rest of three was a dream. Once that really hard first night was over, I remember shooting the stuff in the bedroom. You force jump over there. You force smack each other in the head and then you force do it all over again. Jazzy. Magic fingers. I'm sorry, I'm just doing Magic this all over the place. We were really having a good time and everybody really got it. You could tell we're having some fun and that we're making stuff and feeling good. One of my favorite things about it, the opening of the briefcase, where we're all kind of looking at it. And I remember, well, I think it was one of the first takes where like I make that like noise, like the whatever noise, and they both kind of look at me. I was really comfortable with the fact that there are two people playing a one-player game. They're playing Jedi Outcast for the original Xbox, and they're pretending to play two-player. It's not in <laughs> PvP as we're fighting each other with lightsabers and it cuts to the screen. It's like, no, this is just the normal one-player game, but who cares? I think three is like the best 
version of what that could have been. Like, even though it was just a bunch of dipshits fucking around, we were trying to make something cool, and we actually pulled it off. You know, I think my biggest memory of three, honestly, is after we were done, we went up to Travis's room in his house and sat down and started watching footage, watching our takes and watching them sort of one, and then we'd skip to another and skip to another, and you start watching it and going like, oh, you know, I think we actually have something here. Okay, I think this is gonna work. I think this might actually be, this might actually be something. What hopes do you have for the final product? I hope that everybody sees it and everybody likes it. Good answer. What ended up happening with three was I went off and cut it and posted it to get it into a local film festival here in Tyler, which it won. Then I kind of went, well, shit, I got to put it on the internet now. One thing to understand is like, this is before YouTube. Like the idea that this would sort of go anywhere other than maybe like a local film festival, I think was not really in our minds at all. Cause there wasn't an idea that, oh, you would just make a thing and then you could just send it out to the world and they could all watch it. So then I got fanboysproductions.com and getting it was a nightmare. I still hate buying websites and paying for websites. It makes me insane, but I put it on fanboysproductions.com and you could click on it and watch it on the site. It gave me a place to actually host it for my $250 a month or whatever it was. But you would click on it and you could download it. It would really just open in your browser. It was an MPEG, like an MPEG 2 or something, right? Or whatever was more compressed at that point. It was tiny and it was finally on a website. That was where I went, oh, now I get to get it on force.net. I remember I took a deep breath and I started a thread on force.net and it was scary as fuck. It was a party. All the people, a lot of these guys who are now Hollywood effects people were in there, you know, talking about it. And there was really only one or two people who were who were down on it and who were buttheads about it. And for the most part, people enjoyed it. One of the things that I liked about Three in the Afternoon was that it, it takes place in the real world and it's real people. And that opens you up to a, a very different style. And it's refreshingly funny. You know, I, I was obviously, you know, checking out pretty much any fan film that I came across through uh, the Force.net. Three in the Afternoon was one of those at some point. And I just enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. I thought it was funny and had a good time with it and wanted to see them make more. One of the roughest parts about it was the saber effects, which Travis had done himself. So, you know, he was following <laughs> tutorials that I had made um, to try to do it. But, you know, it was, he, he admittedly, it was, you know, it's not his forte, not right in his wheelhouse or anything. And really the one thing about it that I was like, you know, I, I just wish the Sabres looked better. I want, I want these guys to make more. I wish for their success. And so I reached out to Travis and just said, hey man, I liked your film. I thought it was cool. You want a second pass on your lightsaber effects? And I'm telling you, I could not believe it. It's kind of like, <laughs> we, 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 we only did this because we saw your thing and was like, well, yeah, why can't we do lightsabers in modern day? You know, like, who cares why these guys are fighting? It doesn't matter. It's a cool fight. Surely we can do this and give it a little story and be, uh, you know, add another layer to it. I immediately, res you know, responded. I was like, Ryan, you got to understand, like, the video you made a year and a half ago, like, that's why this is here, brother. Like, I've just watch the devil out of that and you really like that's crazy i can't believe you would want to do that if, you know that would be amazing and he was like oh yeah don't worry about it. you know he was of course super stoked to have me do it and i, I think i knocked it out in just a couple of weeks it, it wasn't a huge uh, burden to do and at the time i wasn't working and so i had some time just kicking around at home with my folks the joy of the doing is very much alive 
for Ryan Weaver. This is somebody who has been not only active in that community, but has introduced so many people to the career of VFX and really will never, I don't think, ever get the credit that's really due him. And so it was this incredible blessing. You know, I called everybody. I called Corey and Pruitt and everybody. I was like, you guys just don't even fucking understand. Ryan Weaver's going to fix our lightsabers. This is going to be, it's going to look so stinking good. Ryan had done, you know, just a couple of stills for us, or maybe it was a little sequence. And then you get that back and you just, you see it. You're like, oh my God, we're holding like real lightsabers. You know, you have that visceral reaction of like, oh my God, it's like the real thing. And yeah, I mean, it was just it's super exciting to be hanging around while Travis and Ryan were going back and forth over the internet and getting shots back. It was just like my brain melted because it's kind of like, I'm, I'm in a thing where I'm wielding lightsabers that look as good, if not better than the movies that I love and they look real. It's amazing what having the perfect special effect can do and elevate something above its kind of basic parts that it started with. Uh, it's, it goes to show you don't need a lot. Getting shots back from Ryan is always this incredible moment where you're just so thrilled or you just can't wait to check your email and, and look at what he's done with it. He starts sending back shots and it was just Christmas over and over and over again. I'll never forget feeling that way. It was just crazy. And also at this time, like the fact that Travis could put the video on the force.net, hook up with somebody there who lives in California and then work, work together across the world like that, or across the country like that was also a thing that at the time was crazy. Getting in contact with him, I was just like, I like these guys. They're, they're really cool. You know, Travis is, uh, is, uh, is a real nice guy and, uh, would love to work with him someday, which of course then we did. And so we get him into the movie we're feeling great and then put it back on force.net and you know and now ryan weaver's done the effects and and everybody you know enjoyed it again i remember him putting it on the force.net and then like talking to me and being like i think i'm gonna put it on this youtube thing in 2006 youtube.com was the third most visited website on the entire internet and its popularity was growing exponentially it was like not a thing yet it was like yeah, there's this YouTube thing. People are putting videos on it. I think I'm going to put the movie on there. Start a channel, got it up on YouTube. Back in that time of YouTube, you could ride the tags in such a way where if you put the tags in as the same tags as that video, you would show up in recommended. And the closer your tags were to that video, the closer in recommended on the right, you would show up. The Force Unleashed had a tech demo. It was really short. Maybe it was two minutes long. Everybody was freaking out. I copied one by one. I did all the tags from that tech demo to three in the afternoon. And that afternoon, half a million people watched three in the afternoon. You're refreshing the page and you're checking the view count. You know, you're watching the numbers going, holy shit, and you're watching the comments and it's people who are like, this made me really laugh. What happened to Corey? This is great. I can't believe it. On the whole, I would say three fourths of the response to three in particular was overwhelmingly positive. People really liked it and were extremely positive about their reaction. It was fairly quickly once it was up on YouTube and it was kind of crazy. It was a little bit before like I had a few people recognize me out in public like you're from three in the afternoon right? Like yeah 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 you know it's like oh that's awesome it's like glad you enjoyed it. I remember calling everybody and there were people I called who were involved with the movie who were thrilled and there were people I called who I got the sensation kind of went oh I'm sorry, a million people just watched it? I was elated. Of course, I'm I'm freaking out. And the comments were, some people were assholes, but for the most part, online, it's a love fest. Whereas in my personal life, there was an energy of, well, whatever you do next, you're not gonna, you're not gonna keep going with that, are you? And I remember being slowly, quietly, 
a little heartbroken that there wasn't a so you know like what's next kind of a feeling with three it set this tone of like well if i don't gin up the enthusiasm for it and if i don't go hey everybody this is what we're gonna do then nothing really was gonna happen what ended up happening was three comes out and then i go back to austin for a while a buddy of mine wrote a script for a movie called tyler dome yeah i hate to say it but afraid we're gonna have to get jobs here pretty soon don't say things like that. There are still hundreds of dollars left to steal from Dad's account. We just have to find out what he changed his pin number to. Yeah, but we're gonna need some serious cash to fund a movie. Yeah, but Christ, we've gotta write a movie first. Yeah, we gotta come up with an idea for the movie just so we can write it. You know, we wanted to make a movie just so we wouldn't have to work. But who knew that actually making a movie would be work? I grew my hair out and we moved in, me and a couple of buddies, we all got together and started making this movie. We had done three and our buddy Derek came to us with a full feature length script. It was like, hey, I've got this movie. Do you guys want to do it? You know, he was the lead, but he had written parts for all of us. And the kind of core cast was Derek, Travis, and myself, which I hated because again, I don't like being on camera and never was a fan of it, but they all say I was funny so whatever man at this point we can make a snuff film for all i care yeah trev you can get your girlfriend to be in it since when do you have a girlfriend i don't i don't he's being shy well does she have big titties because you better break up with her if she doesn't have big titties shut up josh just kidding man i just like saying titties someone say titties yeah. We had been doing commercial work for Trav's mom. So the idea for that summer was we're going to use the money we're making off of our commercial work to basically subsidize the rent. So we're going to do the commercial work during the day and then in the afternoon and evening, shoot this full feature film. So to us, it was essentially just party house. And it went okay. It lasted about seven months, and we shot about 40 edited minutes of material before it all blew up in our faces. And it's the same old story, right? We got good stuff. The stuff we did shoot, which was maybe 20% of the script, actually turned out pretty well for what it is. Pruitt, you want to be in our zombie movie? I think if Pruitt is going to be in your zombie movie, you ought to hit him with a car again. You want to get hit by a car again? Okay. You've been hit by a car before? Yeah. Great. Now all you have to do is write the movie around Pruitt getting run over by a car. I watch it now years later and it's funny as hell. The damn thing's funny. Jesse's funny in it. Derek's funny in it. It clearly is coming from somewhere and we could have finished it. But there was a lot of interpersonal stuff going on at the time. It was not a fun seven months. Tyler Dome was a rough period. <laughs> I was really proud of it. I thought he did a great job writing it. There's still a soft spot in my heart for that. And I was really gung-ho to shoot that. But we were young and made some mistakes. We should not have lived together. It was like we were, we were living together. We were working together. It was like too much time together. There's absolutely tension on this set. But when we were rolling and we were working, it was working. You know, interesting fact about semen. Mm. Once it dries, it smells like Fruit Loops. Thanks. But in between that was really hard. You know, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's a lot of little things. It's the things we say to each other. It's the things we don't say to each other. My peer group, I wanted them in my orbit. I love them as people very much. And all of us, myself included, had a pattern of behavior that is not conducive to a creative effort. And the movie reflects it. It's all over Tyler Dome. It's like the whole deal with the movie is just how verbally savage they are with one another. So I thought you guys were supposed to shoot a movie today or something. Yeah, we were going to, but we don't have any ideas. We've been sitting here trying to think of something to shoot. I've been sitting here trying to think of something. He's just been reading the men's underwear ads all day, rubbing himself under the table. 
Oh, Travis, you sick fucking bastard. How dare you bring your debauched influence into this good Christian home? You guys are hilarious. Real nice. And the expectation in the movie and in real life is that you can process that and you can handle that. And in fact, it's part of the gas in the tank. It's part of what makes this so funny and cool. We did not have the emotional intelligence nor the maturity to identify what about that is interesting and how to put that in the movie. Look, man, guys lie about their sexual conquests all the time. It speaks highly of you that you're honest and upfront about your inexperience. Now, this Aaron chick, she likes you. Trust me. So you're obviously doing something right. Whatever that is, I have no idea, but regardless, just be yourself and be honest with her about that stuff, and if she's a good girl, then she'll be cool with it. And if not, she'll laugh in your face and go tell all of her friends about you. Jesus. That's what they do. Derek and I always had an odd relationship. Very cynical, very sarcastic, very funny, very smart. What's the fucking line? Do you know it? <laughs> what is the line? Do you know it? You're an asshole. You're an asshole. We weren't communicating, and he got into a habit of hurting my feelings, and I got into a habit of disappearing, and he got into a habit of disappearing. Once we got started, Derek kind of, I don't know if it was depression or what, kind of withdrew and didn't really talk to anybody outside of shooting, just kind of stayed in his room, didn't really interact. So there was, it was just kind of a weird vibe in the house. We hit kind of a point where we were supposed to be doing commercial work to pay for the rent. And Trav and Aaron had been pretty serious, you know, in their, in their relationship at that point. So Trav didn't really want to work. He just wanted to spend time with Aaron, which is totally fine, which left most of the commercial work to me. And I started getting a little perturbed, I suppose, about kind of the, the workload that I was having to do when Trav really wasn't doing much and Derek wasn't contributing anything at that point. It got to a point where it was like pulling teeth to one, get Derek in a mood where he actually wanted to be involved to get this thing done and to get Trav out of the bedroom and actually go and shoot some stuff. I was in a relationship that I was really excited about and I was meeting the woman that would be my partner for the rest of my life. And after so many years of being the single one, while everyone to my left and to my right was having their fun, to be in a serious relationship and to finally have real companionship and be excited about it, I was picking up signals that they were resentful of that. And they saw that as a distraction for me. And I should have been doing this and I should have been there and I should have been doing it better and more and sooner. I'm putting everything I own and have into the effort. And I was in a toxic social dynamic with my high school peer group. I hit a point where I had to get away. Trav called me, I remember one afternoon, he said, hey, hide my shit, because my parents are coming over. Okay, no big deal. And about 10 minutes later, him and Aaron and Cynthia and Kenny showed up and basically got all the Trav shit and left. Like, he just moved out. Just up and moved out. And left me and Derek there with no jobs, with a rent to pay. So me and Derek had to rush to get jobs so that we could continue to pay the rent and not be homeless. That's not easy for anybody. It wasn't easy for me. I know it wasn't easy for them. There's not another agency. There's not another person or supervisor. Once you get out of the nest and you're going to go be grownups in your 20s and you're going to go try and do something, you better be able to take care of one another. You better be able to show grace to one another. You better be able to, God forbid, love one another. It was very rough, but it was also like, it was just a compounding of issues. My mom passed in 2003, so I was still pretty fucked up from that. I was not mature enough and emotionally prepared to have my mom pass pretty suddenly. And then basically the dissolving of my friend group and essentially my entire world, because that's Trav and Corey and Pruitt and Josh and Derek at that point were like, that was my family. Those, those, that's who I had. So for all of that to just completely go out the window, like it, it fucked me up and, and I was pretty bitter about it for for a good long while until you know you come to realize that that we were all stupid kids acting emotionally and irrationally and none of us were emotionally mature enough to deal with the shit we were dealing with or try to approach any of those situations in a mature way 
And meanwhile, I'm 25 and the feeling of like, well, what are you going to do is in the air. During making this movie, we'd go smoke cigarettes on the patio and I was like, I want to make a sequel. Yellow. After we shot three, and as we were finishing it, I was dating Aaron. We were going out a lot and sneaking around town a lot and going into places we shouldn't be, sneaking onto rooftops and sneaking into places I knew the codes to. She went off to study in Leeds, England for a year, and we had a distance relationship. And so during that, I was writing six pretty strongly. A month-long mystery deepened today when two homeowners discovered burglars entered their home through a hole burned through their bedroom wall. This is the fourth such burglary in the last month. Sources close to the investigation told us they suspect the burglars used an arc welder or blowtorch to cut the man-sized hole in the house. Police say they are looking at tradesmen who own this type of equipment. Blowtorch my Stranger, ass. Perhaps I started watching Escape from New York a lot. The first Ninja Turtles on repeat, watching Amadeus all the time. The Amadeus DVD would run and run and run and run and then it would start the movie again. And I'd have it on for days. And then like really deliberately Escape from New York and Ninja Turtles, that's where Six really comes out of us. This very street level, we're gonna infiltrate something, we're, we're gonna sneak up on somebody, we're gonna sneak around and do stuff. I started shooting a documentary with an ex-cop about how to hide marijuana from law enforcement. And it created a lot of noise in my life, as you might imagine. It was just a very busy, heady time. When we get back from the break, the Emperor of Star Wars himself, George Lucas, has a big announcement tomorrow. We'll take a look at that after these messages. I cracked the safe sabers thing at like two or three in the morning. It was like a eureka, holy shit thing. Brian had a lot of input on the Hasbro element of it. We were on the phone, we were emailing. I'm showing him pages. He probably should have got a co-story by credit for that alone. One of the kind of like, huh's of six is the, the Travis's friend in Japan who sends him a lightsaber. I think I know exactly where it came from was I needed Travis to get another lightsaber. I needed it to be a safe lightsaber. and I needed it to kind of kick the plot off because he was in hiding too, but he's in his bathrobe and he's depressed. So he's the only way we really show that is that he's eating cereal and watching the news. That's Joe Terrell, who was the lead anchor and is now the news director of KLTV, who was working closely with my dad at that time. And Joe's a great guy and volunteered to, you know, deliver this great opening bit that we shot up at KLTV and he just nailed it. And he lends a big chunk of legitimacy to the thing right out in front of this, this voiceover and this voice that you're hearing. And so I knew I wanted to lead with that. We're going back into the world. We're gonna see it the same way. We're getting exposition and information and some world building is going on. The stakes are high. And, and in three, we warn of high stakes. And in six, we really warn of high stakes. It needs to start getting real. Six begins to blend that a little bit. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon. Travis, right? That sounds right to me. That's great. I'm Jim from Hasbro, and as you know, you were one of our lucky playtesters for our new real lightsabers. You should have your comment card and signed agreement ready. You're kidding. No, I'm not. And then the guy knocks on the door, and he's in a suit, and then it's this, and it's that, and then, well, wait a minute, and he checks the case, and there's a piece of paper. Oh, my God. If only there is enough time. I never found a real great way to articulate how Pruitt and Corey were going to deal with what happened that I could write on a whiteboard. I knew that Pruitt would just go back to work. Pruitt would keep it in his bag, 
and just he'd have to go back to work. He can't go be a superhero because Pruitt just projects this innocent bystander feeling to him. There's this really wonderful kind of passive, playful energy to Pruitt that always made him work on camera. Hi, everybody. Well, it looks like Mutt and Jeff are in charge of the invention exchange this week. Joel Hodgson has this, too, of this sort of like, I'm here, but I'm half here, but I am here. Meanwhile, Corey is off the grid listening to Mozart. Corey. Corey, come on, open up. It's trapped. Come on. Come on. You know, is Dr. Doom in his castle building all his machinations, and, and that's as far as he's gotten. And so we're at a great moment with him where, what's he really going to do? What's his first move? But we know the path he's mostly chosen, so we've got a redemption story with Corey going. Both of them were very good at that. Corey and Pruitt, both they're really good actors. They really did a really excellent job of characterizing a version of themselves that had made up their minds about what they were going to do with this. I was completely on board, especially with the pitch. Having it be a thing where it's just kind of like a test just to see if people would kill each other immediately kind of thing. Like looking at it from the corporate overlord standpoint of the people who built these things. Just being like, let's see if these people actually kill each other. And it's like, oh, they don't? Okay, well, maybe we can do this toy thing. Where are you going to sell these lightsabers? And how old do you have to be to buy one? That's two questions. No, no, that's okay. Let's see, we're exclusive for two weeks at Toys R Us, and then it's Target, Sharper Image, KB, and hopefully Walmart by Christmas. KB Toys? That's right. You're going to have those clowns coming out of Hot Topic with those stupid buckles all over their pants with lightsabers on their belts. You won't be able to get near the mall. Listen. People are going to sneak them into ball games and, and hide them under the seats of their cars, not to mention just sparring and getting their damn heads chopped off. We've already thought of that. Starting next year, we're going to be opening up lightsaber training academies where adults and kids can learn to properly use their lightsabers in a safe and fun environment. Adults and kids? Seriously, if they made like a safe lightsaber that actually emitted like a blade, but it didn't hurt anybody, but it actually was a physical thing that you could fight with, you telling me there, there, there already are like Jedi camps and Harry Potter camps, right? People go to these things to have fun and whatever, but if they actually had a physical blade that came out of a handle, it would like, seriously, it would like, it would be the most, the highest selling toy of all time almost immediately. Like, how many times has this actually happened with toys, where they release a toy and very quickly it's like, oh, you can actually alter this a little bit? Like, oh crap, and then it gets recalled. I mean, that's why it was like, yeah, that's totally believable. Like, it's actually pretty genius as a way to, you know, expand the story and kind of change the scope of it while keeping the original completely intact. So when it came to writing Six and, and we had it, some people were right on board and some people were like, well, let me read it. And I'm like, I think it's pretty smart. And I think it is pretty valid. And people really liked the last one. And I think we should tell another chapter of the story because it's darker and it takes itself pretty seriously. And I think it's worth doing. And Ryan's on board. And Ryan will do all of it. So won't that be like really exciting to create this thing and then be getting things back from Ryan? That was how I couched it was, look, I tried to do another thing. We're all here available right now. We have this story. Let's tell it. I feel like my initial reaction was sort of, do we have to go back to the to that? Like, is it is it better to continue the story forward or leave it at, as a cliffhanger, leave it as as it was? Because it was not originally the idea to to do another one, to do more. It was a one off, and then we were going to do something else. But I think as the as the script came together and we worked on it a little bit, and I was reading it, and I think I eventually you know came around and like, all right, let's do it. This sounds great. I thought the script was cool. We had a lot of conversations with Travis about where we could take it and, and what about this idea? What about that idea? What about this? And, you know, Travis always throwing out ideas and trying to move things forward and get the project done. You know, if it wasn't for Travis and his tenacity and, you know, him pushing this forward and sort of sticking with it, I don't think it would have gotten done. Travis's, you know, sort of mutant abilities, uh, you know, his X-Men skill is to bring groups of people together and get them all to sort of believe in a project and get them to move things forward. Aaron had just gotten back home. She was excited to get back into it. He introduced the script and I was like, okay. It felt like we were kind of wiping the slate and we were gonna go back to something that we all had fun with. And I loved that he was taking it to a new place. And I was like, yes, definitely. 
he's leveling up with this. And you can tell also that he had been through some shit from Tyler Dome and like a lot of the focus of it is he wants his friends back, you know? You know, I just, I just wanted my friends. All right. Like he wants everything to be copacetic again. And that's because things had been rough for a year, you know? So I will say I was wary because of the experience that we, we had had production wise for however long. I was kind of like, are we gonna end up in the same place that we had been? But that was a rough period. And uh, six in the morning brought us back together a little bit, you know? So it was like, okay, let's do this again. This seems like a good place to start, not start over, but production wise, let's get back to our happy place. I was also excited that I was like, okay, this is gonna be like three in the afternoon. That was a good experience. Let's try to recreate that. I think the story was always built to be just really, it was always focused on just the friends and what it was about to hang out and, and what would happen now to their friend group now that this object is dropped in the middle of them. And now what happens to them? What happens to their friendship? What happens to their relationships that move forward? We were all at a time in our lives where you're, yeah, you're definitely on the edge of, you're not high school kids anymore, you know? And so, yeah, real responsibility and real life is coming in and, you know, real relationships and real work stuff and where your lives are going to move on to next. I mean, you're sort of at that point that many people find themselves in and where how are our paths going to stay together and where are they going to diverge? And then how is this relationship between you and your closest friends going to, going to play out now and, and what's going to happen? These are not toys and you are not a killer. You are a geek. You are a huge nerd. You have been a huge nerd since fifth grade when we'd not dress out for PE so we could read the Star Wars rule book and talk about what we would do if we had real lightsabers. And I am shocked that that conversation has gone on this long. Are you finished? Yeah, listen, uh... What have you been doing? For a month, Corey. If you had it all to do over again, would you do it the same way? You still have a choice, dude. I don't think so, Pruitt. I think our friend Corey made his choice a long time ago. Six took over a year to finally complete, and there were many reasons for it. One was Corey is now very much finishing college and looking toward moving to Los Angeles. And Pruitt is working at a local hospital, so planets were starting to line up. Ryan could do it. Ryan was available. And so by the time it was, I was ready to make it, I remember I didn't have to fight super hard to get it done. And it's a fan film. Six was also built to rattle the cage of what a fan film is. Because part of the reason why three was met with this uh, feeling was I went at that. I didn't shy away from that because I wanted to take dead aim at that audience and I wanted to take that format head on. They are as challenged as any character in a movie and the circumstances that they're in are as dire and as eventually earth-shaking as it would be if they were in a film. We had like a practice day in my driveway where we choreographed and we just figured it out and we videotaped how that was all going to work. And then we referred to it on set because that was what Ryan had done for RVD. So he was like, hey, well, listen, when you shoot it, you should go through it and you should videotape that. Make sure you roll it on set so that you can remember where everybody's hands are supposed to be and what moves they do and when and whatnot. He was absolutely right. And I remember having to kind of navigate what everybody was, was willing to do because we weren't going to do a thing where it was wildly stunt heavy. And so we got it together. First injured message. Jonathan Pruitt, it's uh, Travis. Uh, I know we haven't talked in like a month, but we need to because we have a serious problem. There's this guy following me in a white van. In so we start shooting six. We shoot everything at the house. We shot me in gym. And I think that was it because then we went outside and we did Pruitt getting hit. Back in the day, I wanted to be a stuntman. There was a time where like, I wanted to actually do that, but it's like, how do you be a stuntman? You know, I mean, you could find someone and they can teach you and get hired on with a company, but it's, it was like really hard. But like, yeah, growing up, I was always doing ridiculous things.
and so as soon as he kind of told me, well, hey, I want to be a stuntman, so let's do some, let's do something, you know, like, I'm, all right, well, can I, can I hit you with this van? <laughs> When we did that that van, a little <laughs> the minivan thing. I remember me and me and Jim being in that, having to time that out to where we came in there, and then he's got the camera in the van, and we actually hit him. Yeah, I think we didn't do that too many times at all, from what I remember. That van that they used to hit me was actually my van at the time. Just this crappy delivery van from a place I worked that got rear-ended, so I bought it for 260 bucks. Best financial investment I've ever made. I drove it for six years, but it was the perfect van for a creepy bad guy to run over the hero or one of the heroes. He chose to do these things. We didn't make him do these things. He was like, I'm just going to get in front of the car. We're going to do, <laughs> you know, like he's our action hero. We're going to look at the rigging back here. <laughs> we have a camera in the back of this van. Fucking awesome. Let's do it. Here we go. Action. I have an idea. Meet me tonight at midnight <coughs> behind the Toys R Us. And I'm on my way now to Corey's to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? I think we need to exchange insurance. <laughs> now. What? Man, tell you what? The toy you were given. Where is it? Toy. Uh, yeah. It's about 12 inches long. Runs on batteries. That's right. Pink ribs fits in your purse. <laughs> God, I don't think you're gonna want it back now. We were actually talking about that scene and how I was like, that was a that was a lesson because uh, when you when you learn about body positioning and what that does to the human blood flow. <laughs> oh god, you're turning blood red. I was like lightheaded and my arms were going numb in that scene because they had me kind of bent backwards on the hood of that van for so long. And so I just kind of started using it, but then we started having to take breaks because I'm like, hey guys, I'm like I'm getting tunnel vision because like literally my blood pressure is getting messed up from you know, the angle that you're holding me at. I can do it again. I can do this all, right. all last time. Hang on, let me plug it back in my brain for a second. That's weird. I'm doing a thing with the... Okay. <laughs> I remember distinctly, like, Big Aaron asking me because he has his hand on my throat. And I'm like, hey, man, just put your hand there. Like, you can go ahead and squeeze a little bit. It's fine. I'll let you know, but I'll sell the rest of it. He was always he was always a good sport doing that whole thing, man. Whatever it took, he was willing to do it. And he was literally, I mean, hurting several nights that we were out there doing that. Jonathan's Everyone one of those lovable star. characters that gets beat up, you know. <laughs> it's a lie. It was worth it, so... And also, you know, I used to take and teach Taekwondo. So like getting thrown against a van, I was like, no, throw me against the van. I got it. I know how to fall. And so you see me like slam my arms against the van so I don't really get hurt, but it makes a lot of noise and looks painful. You're going to be there tonight to meet your friends, and there had better be three pretty little lightsabers all in a row in their original case. And they had better be behind that Toys R Us at midnight. Or otherwise, my officer friend here is going to run over you again, and then he's going to take you to jail. No! No! Not the face! <laughs> uh, I don't know where he's going to go. <laughs> And then we did our plates, which aren't really plates, but we did our exteriors at Toys R Us. So there was a real Toys R Us in Tyler, but that's not where we shot the scenes that take place behind it. The shots of the front and me running up. By the time Travis gets over here, he's going to be totally out of breath. Action! Be no act. <laughs> oh God, I'm going to die. That was done we could literally walk to it from where I'm at right now. But we shot the exteriors and the whole back of six around the side of a, what is then, and I think still is a Bed Bath & Beyond. I live near it, I should know this. Then we started shooting around the corner and we shot all of it. It's kind of like in between shot music a little bit. If I can see one of them in front of the light. Jigs, 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 jigs. Every single person was helping with something, either setting up lights and setting the whole scene, anytime we'd have to switch the cameras and change the lights. 
It was just Travis directing us and us moving the stuff into the right spot and like whoever wasn't helping with that would just kind of stand where they're supposed to to make sure they're lit properly. My best memories of shooting six are, are all behind the Bed Bath & Beyond and Tyler. That sort of long alleyway that we're playing on is our sort of battlefield back and forth there. It's so much fun to, with, that we had this sort of small town playground to be in. This little town that sort of rolls up the streets, as we would say, you know, at about 10 o'clock. And we would go out late and we could do whatever we wanted and no one really cared. Do you want to be busted, same thing, or is that going to be Sorry. too much of everybody looking? It's your take, man. I built a dolly, you know, in the dolly shots of me in the garage. I went and bought skateboard wheels at a skate shop and bolted them to aluminum flashing like you would put along your gutters and bolted that to a 32 by 32 piece of plywood and built a PVC pipe frame. I used that dolly for years before I bought real wheels that I then bolted onto another 32 by 32 piece of plywood. And I still use that guy. It's sitting right there. We're now gonna figure out a way to uh, move this dolly left to right without these cords fucking us up. Oh. I know I ain't that strong. Up there. Yeah, uh, it must have just been slightly off. Make sure the wheels are lined up. Listen, kids, those are collectibles. They're not for dueling. They can be very, very dangerous if used irresponsibly. Now, as you know in the documentation that was included with your lightsabers, your 30-day playtesting period is up. On behalf of Lucasfilm Limited, we hope you enjoyed the product and will recommend them to your friends. I have a coupon for 10% off for each of you so that you can rush to the toy store tomorrow and buy your real, official Star Wars lightsaber. Unfortunately, those particular lightsabers are the property of Hasbro and Lucasfilm Limited. By accepting them at your door, you entered into an explicit agreement to return them after 30 days. If you refuse, the officer here will arrest you so that we can press charges. And the fact of like bringing, you know, Jim Davis in and especially Big Aaron is like his silent muscle that just kind of sits there and, <clears throat> you know, grunts and the kind of casual indifference and callousness that Jim Davis's corporate character has in this. Like when we're fighting him and he's like, dude, we fight during lunch. What? You think I haven't done this before? My buddies and I do this every day at work during our lunch hour. Like this is nothing. Like we don't really care. We just have these so we do it. So, I mean, I could kick your ass. It doesn't matter. I've been training with this. But it's just kind of like that corporate mindset of indifference to your fanboy, like, love of something. Because they just want to make a buck and they need to get the originals back now. Thank you very much. That's why it made a perfect grounded villain. I think it's a fool what gives away something he wants to keep. Now, this is my lightsaber. There are apparently many like it. But this one is mine. I've got a strong sentimental attachment to it. So you can take that 10% off coupon and shove it up your ass. And how about this? You can't arrest us because he's not a cop. After they had gone over the idea of what that character was going to be like, just because I had the uniform I actually wore, I actually still have that. It's still hanging up back in the closet back there. It was an old uh, security, basically, there wasn't any official things on it. It was just a basic security officer shirt. And so we tried to make it look sort of legit, you know, as, le as legit as possible without being too legit, too overwhelming. Yeah, maybe you don't hold it up like that. Maybe you just pull it. How about just pull it? Do this. Pull it from here. Light it from there. Light it from there and go with a flashlight. It's gonna just, be just awesome. just like it's a flashlight. <laughs> that quick? Yeah. <laughs> I can do it. I mean, what you? That's no, awesome. Do okay. it. Whenever he called us out on it at the time in the film, and you can tell that, you know, that, oh, they know they're onto us. This is not really a by the book thing. It's an intimidation thing. Well, there was a time where a cop car pulled up to us. The gate was just wide open. They didn't ever closed it. That's why we filmed over there. I'm sure somebody had called in on us. I don't remember if it was just a routine thing or somebody saw us over there. They heard yelling or something. Action. And he's like, don't worry about this, I'll take care of it. And he takes his wallet out and slings his badge over the front. So he just walks up and he's like, hey guys, what's going on, you know? Kind of explain, we're filming, you know, we're filming this deal. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm a cop and I work over here. He never said he was there officially, but you know, 
He just talked to him for a bit and they were like, oh, cool. And they just hung out and watched his film for a minute and then they drove off. But you couldn't really do that now, I don't think, if we were filming in the same spot. It's just kind of a special time and a, just like a perfect, you know, moment to, to be able to do that. Trade you. going to sell them to children. Where'd you get that? Japan. Then you know you can't hurt someone with it. Do you and your friends really think we would be able to get something like this through a major production pipeline if they were lethal? Well, they're not lethal until you unscrew the battery compartment, take the battery case out, take a pair of needle nose pliers, pull your little child safety chip out, which anyone older than, say, 12... Lucasfilm Limited is not responsible for consequences after tampering with our product. I really wanted to get hurt in the movie. I wanted to be sliced up, and there was a certain way I wanted to see my ass kicked. Cauterizes the wound instantly. I made it a story thing too is one of the things that's so entertaining about Six is he's the one who takes the most physical punishment. Like he's not even supposed to be there today. It's one of those things, right? He's not even supposed to be here today. And so he should be rightfully punished because it pulls at everyone else emotionally to watch him get hurt. Oh, you son of a... It wasn't hard to be in agony. It was hot. I'm in a bathrobe. It's the first thing you get used to is just feeling gross and being hot and sweaty. And then also just kind of like wiping all that off and being like, all right, roll it. Who's in this next shot? It's me and you. You can go sit down. Okay. Action. I'm going over there. You do that. All right. We're moving on to the next one. You got to get back up, but you can go sit down. All right, fine. People aren't ready. It's they're too popular. Oh fuck! What are you doing? Me? <laughs> what is that? So I don't have this. No one can tell. Me? Oh, Travis? I mean, both you kind of. But What's going on? Oh, Travis has got a beard. Beard. A man's beard. Just seeing you delivered. Oh my god, bitches in the living room getting it on, and they ain't leaving till six in the morning. So what you want? human race. How does that feel? All right, oh, here we go. Good. Stop humping me. Here we go. We're rolling. Okay. I threw my back out at one point when we were shooting the fight. I'll never forget when Jim grabs Aaron by the neck. We showed up to shoot that night, and within an hour, I threw my back out. The wheelchair we were using as a dolly wheelchaired me off the set. I was just like, we're just not shooting. We just all we just folded it. Oh, that was bad. That was probably the first time that ever happened to him. It's happened many times since then. <laughs> I was nervous for him. I don't think anybody else was too too worried about it because we were all still fairly young and it wasn't really on our radar that someone's hurt their back and like, that's a big deal yet. I was nervous for him because I'm like, you're doing like fight scenes and you're carrying the camera around. But his brother was there. So I think he was having Tyler do some of the shooting. He made a highlight reel at one point of all the times I got injured, like fingers hit by lightsaber blades, kicking the fire hydrant, you know, even uh, Jim Davis punching me in the face. Like he literally, like there's only one take of that and he punched me in the face. Action. <laughs> oh, oh. And my inside of my mouth was bleeding for a while and I had to go walk away so things didn't escalate because you know, getting your bell rung is, uh, can bring out some, some instincts that you're like, oh, I got this under control. No, I don't. Just get away from me, please. Like. <laughs> Saw this in a movie once. One side, Pruitt. Not this time, brother. Pruitt, look at me. I am the captain of this ship. Which ship? This guy hit me with a van. And he damn near cut me in half. Now take the train.
you know, I would still talk to Pruitt and, and Derek from time to time, and they had told me that they were gearing up to start shooting six, and then it was, hey, we're shooting six. It was still a little bitter, but I do remember I had we had a party at our house, and I, I can't remember if Travis reached out to me prior or if I reached out to him, but he ended up coming to the party, and we hung out for a bit and, and kind of talked through some shit. And he was like, well, hey, we're shooting six. And they were pretty far into production at that point. He's like, you know, do you want to do anything on six? And I was like, you know, if you need me for something, just just let me know. But I did show up and, and help shoot some stuff. I think I did two or three days on six in the parking lot behind Hobby Lobby or whatever it was. Then in the break, I get this phone call from Ryan. And he's like, hey, could you do like two and a half weeks in... Atlanta, because uh, we're going to go shoot RVD2. Ryan vs. Dorkman 2 was pretty much a direct response to the popularity that Ryan vs. Dorkman had made. It was not lost on us that that kind of attention can be fleeting. And so we felt that, well, you know, if that's going big now, it's been a few years. We both feel like we could do better now. We should try and put it out there and hopefully at least have something closer to what we feel is our best work up there for people to check out. I think a big part of the appeal of my fights is that we're deliberately pretty modest in terms of the scope of like, you know, we don't do costumes and we have an industrial environment, but it's not a set. It's always fun to see the debate when people go, well, they don't have a story. And it's like, well, so what? You know, if they're what they are. They're these beautiful choreographed pieces, a little bit calculated, you know, as a showcase, as a look what we can do kind of a piece. And they did it really well. Ryan vs. Darkman was shot it was me, Michael, and Colin, who was a friend of mine who was running camera the whole time. And, and my dad was there to give us rides and stuff <laughs> and to help out in other ways. And then Ryan versus Darkman too. You know, we had Travis there and we had our friend Brandon out as well. Really, that was the team. I think a big part of our appeal is that you can sort of feel that on the other side when you watch it, that this isn't a big production. This is just some dudes with cameras and know their way around After Effects. Because we didn't feel like we were actually making a Star Wars fan film per se. We're making a lightsaber fight, you know, which, you know, how you want to split hairs on that is, is another thing. We've had three years since the last one. So we really are hoping that we're going to make something that's a lot more dynamic, a lot more interesting, a lot smarter in terms of the choreography in terms of the camera work, in terms of the editing style, everything that we possibly can, we're just gonna to try to do better and as good as we, as we can now. The choreography and the fighting and the effects are just stunning. And then I show them to people, I'm like, you gotta check this out. And they sit and they're like, who made this? You know, and that's what's great when someone gets to sit there and watch it and be like, how'd they do that? And it's more impressive sometimes than what you see in big movies. For Ryan vs. Darkman 2, we knew there were a lot of people out there who were pretty interested in us doing that and would potentially support us. And now there wasn't, you know, Kickstarter or Indiegogo at the time, but I made a PayPal link. And basically we went up and jumped around and said, hey, we're going to do a second lightsaber fight. If you'd like to support us financially to help us make it be all it can be, here's a link. And uh, we got quite a bit out of that. Not a ton. I mean, we got, a, we got a few grand out of it. Enough to buy a new camera, which was a prosumer HD. HD 720p camera and a laptop to take with us and, and edit on and capture with. And that's really about it. And then, you know, some airfare out to Atlanta. The feeling of it was that they were trying to figure out whether they needed one more person because they were pretty sure that they could just zap it with the three of them. But then I think as they got closer and closer, Ryan was like, I want to call Travis. And I think it's pretty clear why. 
We had a great rapport going, and I invited him to come out and help us uh, shoot the thing. Sight unseen, never having met personally before, which is, you know, maybe a tradition with these saber fights, because I had not actually met Michael Dorkman Scott face-to-face -face until he flew out for us to film it and choreograph it. So it was the same thing with Travis, which is just like, like this guy, we, we're fans of each other's work, let's, let's do something together. By then I had explained to him in detail the circumstances of the production of three and then eventually what we were facing with six, obviously, and, and he knew all about it. And so it means a lot to me that he made that phone call because I remember right away being like, oh my God, uh, hell yeah, absolutely. And I remember in my peer group and my friends, everybody was like, oh, cool, you know, wow, okay, great. That's, that's really neat. I couldn't believe it. It was like being asked to go shoot Spider-Man or something. You know, it was as big as anything. So I packed my car, I put my computer in my car, I put my camera in my car. I left in the morning and just drove all day and I, I got there late at night. You know, you're 26 and you're indestructible and I've got my entire life in my car. We went out to Atlanta, Georgia to film Ryan vs. Dark Man 2 in a tortilla factory. Los Amigos tortillas and uh, Ruben was uh, the owner of the place, super nice. Say Ruben, what made you decide to uh, let these guys come in and, and have the run of the place like oh, this? And I was so impressed with the first uh, RBD that it, I, and the background, I think there was a satellite in the background on the first one and I said, oh man, it's gotta be, my place has to be uh, one of their, their options to come because uh, it's a unique facility. We have a lot of ovens, a lot of stainless steels. You can see a lot of things hanging down. So I offered it to them and they called me up and said that they, uh, they're they interested. So here we, here we are now. <laughs> I can still to this day smell that tortilla factory. <laughs> they were staying in a weekly rate shithole in Atlanta and Brandon sleeping on the floor and I'm gonna sleep in between the two beds and we're all just gonna camp this sucker down because we're only gonna be here to sleep. And I set up my computer and I'm showing them six and I'm showing them rough cuts and Mike's looking over my shoulder and, and I was really happy that, you know, Mike was like, oh, this is good, this is pretty cool. That's And so that gave them some confidence in me because I got the sense maybe that Mike was feeling me out to see if I was gonna stink up the place or if I was here to help them make RBD2 because RBD1 was such a hit and they knew it. And then luckily, you know, meeting face to face, hanging out in a crappy little hotel room for the week <laughs> went really well. We gelled very nicely. He was very quick to pick up on what we were after. And we were shooting on the HVX 200 from Panasonic, which was kind of the big brother of the DVX 100, which he had shot three on. And he knew his way around that thing pretty darn quick. And so we were running, gunning, and it went real well. I was very happy working with him on that whole thing. Here we go. One, two, three. You know, that aside, it was really great to be able to come in and have run of the place after the day shift left and just uh, be able to do whatever we want, basically, and have the place to ourselves until a little before the sun came up and people started to come in. Filming in a giant warehouse full of ovens in July in Georgia. So hot would certainly be a descriptive word I would use. Muggy, you know. <laughs> this is. I actually, I tore off pieces of my pants and then you uh, you can wrap it around. Luckily, I buy uh, very big pajama pants to sleep in because I, for some reason, have little care for my own personal appearance and apparently my own hygiene because uh, I'm not sure if these were clean before I took scissors to them and uh, wrapped it around my head to catch the sweat. That's the point. You're holding a camera, your body is in this curious pose and Ryan and Mike are, you know, you're getting the shot, they're depending on you and it goes, into your eyes, into your corners of your mouth, and you just, you want to scream and freak out and drop a $6,000 camera, which you can't do. So I tore off pieces of my pants and wore them. If you don't have any money, rip your clothes apart and put it around your head to catch the sweat. I was projecting to them like an, oh shit, but we've got this feeling that I think we all sort of started to kind of feed on like, oh yeah, I know it's big, but we we can get, we can get, we'll be fine. My contribution to it, they'll tell you, was pretty crucial because of the sort of street level, get it done filmmaking 
element that I brought to it. He shot the hell out of it. And we had a great time doing it too. He was a wonderful personality to have on set. Such a good spirit in terms of just, all right, here we are. What can we do? How can we get this done? You know, filmmaking is all solving problems and he was totally gung-ho for it. Never got discouraged. He was a very, very important factor of how RVD2 ended up, I would say, certainly. There was absolutely a deliberate intent to be more ambitious with the way that we shot it and the kinds of shots and everything. And Travis was right on board with all that and super into it. So he was immediately speaking the same language and we were very in sync on that. And try to introduce a little lighting too. You know, anywhere we could just try to upgrade things. I think we're all on the same page in terms of just anything we could do with the time we had to make it that much better. We, uh, we took a crack at it. Travis, poke your head out. Poke your head out real quick. No. <laughs> Just real quick for the camera. <laughs> okay. I like this one bit. Just gonna come right over and hit me here. It was electrifying. It was so much fun. And it, it made me feel better about Six. And I remember driving away from RVD2, re-energized to finish Six, but it still didn't get done for another handful of months. Then I start picking up the phone and being like, all right, y'all got to come back so we can get these last shots. There was some concern over like, well, how much story do we have to tell to get us to the rest of the movie? And we're not going to overshoot because we don't have everybody... And we're also like, everybody's kind of done and wants to be done. And we're not going to be up all night on whatever you end up doing. So let's just get this part of it licked. There was a significant chunk of it that had not been shot. We shot everything except for Corey at his house, Corey at the door, me at Corey's door, me riding on the hood of the car, and I think me in the garage. And then we got into the summer and I built a cut I mean, obviously there was certainly some procrastination involved, just like, okay, I shot it. I mostly have it cut. I'm working on different things and working on all this stuff. It's going to happen and then we'll shoot the rest of it. The schedule started getting weird and I would have had to pull people back to shoot it. And it wasn't like it was threatening, like it would never get done. It was just a matter of like, probably need to get this thing done. After three, Travis and I had like a good rapport. We obviously made Ryan vs. Dorkman 2 together and everything. We're all just totally happy to be involved in each other's stuff as much as possible. And so it was sort of assumed that I'd be happy to do the, the effects for six as well. The dolly shot that goes down my arm and then I square up in the shot I liked, I blink and I told Ryan and he goes, send it to me. And by God, he took the blink out. And I don't even know when it is because it's gone. And also, you know, we kind of like, he would like kick drafts of the script back and forth with me and sort of just get some input and feedback. I, I wouldn't say that I really had a huge contribution to that, but I was certainly in his brain trust at that point, you know. It was nice. He would be able to then ask me about stuff he wanted to do, but wasn't sure how, you know. So it's like, can we do a scene like this or a, a thing where we do that? You know, how, how, how should we shoot that? You know, that kind of stuff. And so I was very happy to be able to, go, oh, 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 do it this way. And then boom. So I got to do remote uh, visual effects supervising, I guess. <laughs> so as far as that big mess of it, one of the things that really jumped out at me was these cicadas, which recently returned. Well, let me tell you something. When we shot these movies, those cicadas were here. And in three, they're very present on the track. What is the most dangerous aspect of the lightsaber? Uh, that it's uh, an energy blade that can slice through anything. Wrong. And in six, you can really hear it. And in six, you can hear how much work would eventually have to be done. And they're coming here tonight to try to take them? That's right. My ass. As much beautiful work as Ryan did and as much hard work as we all put into it, the real hero of six is Chris Whitlock. At the time, he was going to make records and be a sound engineer. And I handed him a humdinger of a project months later when we had finally, finally shot all of six and I needed to get the back of it done. And he just really did a tremendous job. And I have some fond memories of posting six at, at his apartment. Hi, here at CETA Recording, we strive to make sure that movies don't come out in any quicker than two years. <laughs> this is the actual yeah. movie. It uh, doesn't really look like much, but it's uh, 
It's a beating. That's what it is. The post on six was a challenge, and it was right around the time after we had shot so much of it that that rolled over on me. I was like, oh boy, guys, we've got sound work to do. Like, this is no joke. These cicadas are fucking loud. What is that? So I don't have this? No one can tell. Me? Oh, Travis? I mean, both of you kind of. But What's going on? My recollection is that we told everybody, and there was a teaser. <laughs> We were rolling, we were rolling, weren't we? You fucking oh, I took full advantage of that, too. You've been cutting it off on me too soon. And everybody went, oh, shit. Despite his excitement for announcing six in the morning, Travis realized the post-production would take longer to complete due to complications with the sound. And so then I had to say, hey, it's going to be a little while longer. I knew that I was going to deliver. I knew that I had a good movie. I knew that I had a good thing to show them. But sometimes the project tells you how much longer it needs before it's done, you know, and that happened with six. And so by then, RBD2 is coming out and we went to Los Angeles. We are here in Los Angeles, California. Corey Gray, Jonathan Pruitt, Aaron Irvin and myself, we're at the premiere of Ryan vs. Dorkman 2, which it was my absolute pleasure to get to shoot. And we are here to promise on our hearts, and our other things that she's got, that six is coming out. It's coming out after RBD2, and it's gonna knock you on your ass. We swear and promise, right? Swear, swear and promise. I swear. I swear. I swear. I swear. I swear. <laughs> Scouts on her. Six in the morning is coming out. Look for it. We showed what was finished of six, which was about seven minutes of the end of it to an audience that received it well. And that was very exciting. This man is a saint. And I want everyone to know that. If not for this man, we would not be here. And if you, if you told me three years ago that we would be doing this, I would have told you you were crazy. And as loaded as he is, <laughs> Lightsabers for me are the last pure thing about Star Wars. They're the last beautiful thing that I remember when I was a kid. And I think my film and films like Ravage Door Man and these, they, they tap into people. You know, all you guys who remember when you were kids and there's new kids. The Jews over here, they got new, they got new kids who are discovering this stuff. And, and that's why lightsabers are so great. And that's what I try to do with my film. You're going to get to see one of these films in progress. Uh, you're going to see lightsaber rods. You're going to see orange sticks. This guy's been working on this movie, Ryan vs. Dorkman 2, and he hasn't had a whole lot of time to uh, do other stuff. <laughs> I don't know what the deal with that is, what a jerk, but uh, he, uh... Six is very much a love letter to these guys who made films. I've been making films since I was 10, and uh, these guys were here back when nobody gave a damn. And now people do give a damn, and that's really cool. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's a pleasure to be here. They asked us all to come up front, and then, like, I remember giving autographs, and, like, somebody recognized me from the movie, and I didn't even think they would because by the time we did that, my hair was totally different. And I remember that was a weird experience. Like people wanted me to sign something. And I was like, I just made an indie movie on the internet. Like, <laughs> I don't know, this is weird. But the real stars there were Ryan and Mike. <laughs> And so we had this really wonderful LA time with my brother and my wife and her sister and this really wonderful visit. It, it felt great. You felt like superstars, even though no one was making any money, no one's breaking the internet, but you really felt a tremendous creative validation out of it. Hi, I'm Travis Bowles, writer and director of Three in the Afternoon and its upcoming sequel, Six in the Morning. But where is Six in the Morning? It's a good question. Today, a video appeared online, essentially calling me a liar, <laughs> saying that I, that I, the, questioning the very existence of the movie itself and its likelihood of ever coming out. There's nothing more annoying than someone saying they're going to put something out and it never coming out. And so I totally understand what you're talking about. The inside story is that we're doing the entire post phase on six in the morning for free, for no money. And that really involves three key people, myself, Ryan Weber and a 
very talented fellow named Chris Whitlock. We're in constant communication and he's assured me that the, all the sound design for Six is done and the only thing that we're really waiting on is the score, which he has to record and finish and polish and he's doing all of that work in what little spare time he has. Chris is doing the sound design, Ryan's finished the lightsabers, I've cut it, and that's one of the reasons why I made this video where I traveled to go see Chris was because Chris really felt thrown under the bus when I got on the internet and was like, well, that sound design, boy, it's really taking too long. Or it's really taking a long time. As soon as we get that sound design, we'll be going. And I remember me going and visiting him and him being icy. And I was like, what's what's the deal? What's wrong? And he was like, well, you know, I really feel like you fucking threw me under the bus in front of your fans, man. You said the sound design is the only thing keeping this thing from coming out. And, you know, there's a reason. You've got an ocean of crickets on top of this thing. And if you don't want it to sound like shit, then I, I need more time. It's as simple as that. And I completely understood it. I wanted to be gracious with him and because I didn't pay him a nickel. You know, I didn't have any money. And I'd be like, brother, I appreciate you so much. I can't stand it. And I shouldn't have said it that way. I'm hoping to have the movie out in early October, but I'm not making any more promises. The biggest mistake that I ever made on six in the morning, if you're, you're gonna make a movie and you're gonna put it on the internet, don't tell people you're gonna put it out if you're not ready to put it out. If you believe in six in the morning, if you believe that it is coming out, grab your video camera or webcam and take a five second clip of yourself saying, I believe in six in the morning and code it down and send it to me at Travis at fanboysproductions.com. The first 10 people who send me their clips, I'll send you a DVD of three in the afternoon and six in the morning together as soon as six is ready to be put on the internet. And the first person to send me a clip of themselves saying, I believe in six in the morning, I'll send you an actual screen used lightsaber prop from either three or six. It's probably gonna be from three. I'll have to check the prop closet. And I wanted to kind of make a thing. I wanted to kind of make a happening and a thing and an exciting, you know, event out of it. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you believe in six in the morning. I believe in six in the morning. And you can keep the lightsaber prop. I just wanted to say it for you. I believe in six in the morning. I believe in six in the morning. I really, really do. I'm excited. Travis, I'm here to tell you that I believe in six in the morning. And then the release date got pushed back and I had all these videos. And I remember feeling horrible. Hi, I'm Travis Bowles, writer and director of Three in the Afternoon and the upcoming Six in the Morning, and I have good news. Six is done. It's done, it's finished, fa, fini too, and it's ready for you to watch, and it's pretty kick-ass, and uh, I can't wait for all of you uh, guys and gals to see it, and uh, I'm ready to tell you when it's going to come out, which is not far away. Would you like to watch it, uh, well, I don't know, Sunday? You watch it Sunday? How about Saturday at midnight? How about that? Saturday night, midnight, pop some popcorn, watch three, and uh, curl up and uh, watch six in the morning with us. So if you sent me an I Believe video, thanks. They really did keep me going while uh, we were finishing the movie over the last month. And uh, if you didn't, and uh, you wrote me an email, I have a ton of mail to answer. And I've heard from so many of you, and it's awesome uh, to hear your uh, words of encouragement. And uh, it's paid off, baby. We're here. It's time to put this movie out. So uh, I hope you'll join us Saturday midnight for the world premiere of six in the morning thanks a lot i remember being in sort of an extended panic attack about it and i felt horrible and it went all the way up until the night of release too because i i said it's going to come out such and such time and then as i was uploading to youtube i noticed a typo in the opening crawl the word lightsaber was misspelled of all things and so I remember getting on MySpace or Facebook or whatever it was and being like, guys, I need another hour. And I fixed the typo and I uploaded it. And I remember feeling like I was going to puke, just feeling sick over how ugly the rollout of this movie was and how I knew in my heart that it was worth it, that as soon as you saw it, you were going to love it. I love it. And I was proud of it. Then... It came out and people loved it. We didn't do the kind of numbers that three did, but that was lightning striking. I never expected to have a million views. Well, it seems that 30 years after he revolutionized the film industry, George Lucas is turning his genius to the toy industry. At a press conference at Skywalker Ranch yesterday, Lucas unveiled a groundbreaking 
new technology, a real lightsaber. Through his Hasbro toys arm, Lucas will release the lightsabers to stores in time for the holidays this year. And while he would not disclose what specific mechanism creates the beam of light, he did say that the beam is completely harmless due to a special safety mechanism inside. Fans are certain to snatch these up this Christmas, and tech enthusiasts are left to wonder how they really work. A real dream come true for the millions of fans out there. Another thing about 6-2, the debate internally of whether there should be a stinger for 9. When I brought it up with Ryan, Ryan was kind of like, I don't know whether or not you want to do that because you're really, you know, promising more of this thing and it, and it might be, you know, exhausting. And I was like, yeah, but I think it needs it because I would continue the story. And because the way it ends, it suggests so much more is about to happen. The truck will be here by 6 a.m. When they get here, you destroy them. Every last one. And then tomorrow, we're all going to the ranch. What? What ranch? 5858 Lucas Valley Road, Nicasio, California, 94946. Get him inside. He's going to put out a recall for those lightsabers. Or I'm going to set his flannel shirt on fire. You just watch me, damn it. I want to leave them with a head full of possibilities. I want to leave them wanting more. And then there was other people who were involved with Six who were like, oh, you're not really going to put a, a tease for a third one on the back of that, are you? Like, yeah, goddamn, yeah, hell yeah, I am. Like, it works. You know, I'm going to have all these people do voiceovers and they're kind of they're kind of talking and things are happening. And then it's just going to make you insane to watch a third one. And what on earth is wrong with that? As I was cutting Six, I would look to key people involved with it and who were in it and kind of be like, oh man, when we do nine, this is going to be, you know, we can do this and this and this. And I really think it's, you know, it's, it's a lot more like escape from New York, super street level, we're walking, we're doing all this stuff in the area. And I remember, you know, being looked at it going like, you really want to do nine next, man? Is that really what you want to do? Like, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, kind of like, all right, well, you know, why don't we just get this done and then we'll get this. Okay. All right. I remember I didn't lose my mind, I didn't get upset, but there were a lot of little deaths when I realized that people in our world were just not, you know, as excited about this story and continuing it as I was, or the people who were watching it were. And, and I knew, again, I was right back where I started with them in particular. I was like, okay, well, if I'm gonna make a third one, then I'm gonna have to prove it all over again that it's worth doing. They would always say, you know, we'll write it because I think that the feeling amongst my peer group was that, well, if Travis doesn't have a script, you know, it's all just talk. Yeah, we had had talks about kind of where the idea would go and how big things would have to go and, you know, the world that we had started to set up in, in six and where that would have to go next. I think that definitely played into one of the reasons why I felt maybe we shouldn't move forward because we had set this world up to be a thing that was now going to step beyond I thought just sort of what we could make our, just ourselves. I thought we were sort of stepping into a world now of sort of where all of our, where are our ideas and what our dreams would take us that I don't know if we would be able to sort of reach it. And I think that became sort of an idea for me where it was like, well, then maybe it's better just to leave it. Like it was sort of my instinct after the first one and after the second one, I was, I don't know, for me, it was sort of like, well, let's not make a thing that we're not going to be able to do what we want to do. I felt like with six, we ended up being able to do what we wanted to do. And we took things up a notch. And I felt like the next sort of notch was going to be quite a bit more than what we'd be able to sort of do ourselves. So what are we really going to do with all those lightsabers? We? I really haven't decided yet. Now you're talking about a world you've got to set up and we had ideas of sort of a Ninja Turtles-esque sort of thing and you know the hero team's got to go and Corey has a team of lackeys and they're gonna fight back and then these sorts of ideas had been sort of tossed around and then the idea of all of that and having to do it was too big I thought and so I think things had just gotten to where maybe maybe it's better to leave that to the imagination. That 
project had at least two false starts. Also, the script has never been finished, finished, finished. Ryan wrote a draft at one point. Based on just sort of preliminary conversations that we had had, he at some point, he wrote something. He wrote some scenes or he maybe had a draft of something that I had seen because it was pretty ambitious and everything. And then as just a writing exercise at some point, I got a wild hair up my ass and decided, uh, I was like, hey, I want to I try to write like a really modest sort of like, you know, only like not very many sets, just the same characters, not have to get real ambitious with it, but to sort of offer him an idea of, you know, something that was attainable. It's easy to get consumed in your ambition and get intimidated by it, you know? And so I kind of, just for fun, just wrote a little thing and, and sent it to him. I think he liked it. He asked me for it again, like a, a while later. Later, He was just like, hey, can you send me that, that thing again? Oh, yeah, sure. I've done chunks of it, but it keeps changing because whether or not it's actually something that could become a reality fades in and out. And then just where our lives were. It was just too hard to get us all back in Tyler to spend the time to do the work that we needed to be done. I think that's the main reason why it just never ended up happening. I think everybody involved with three and six reacted differently to its, its viewership, I think is the word I'm looking for. I don't think success is the right word for it. I think it's viewership and the passion of its audience and the amount of communication that it kicked up was a complete shock. And I don't know how much of a positive it was in their life. Part of what is amusing about the front of six is that we're still dealing with this thing that happened. That's kind of fucking stupid is three real lightsabers showed up on their doorstep. And I would go through my life. I would be working for people or people would ask me, you know, what I do, me, Travis Poles, and they're like, oh, you know, I shoot, I shoot videos, I shoot commercials, and I shoot industrials and short documentaries. And I also just put out a short, oh, cool, that's great. What's your short about? It is about three best friends who uh, their doorbell rings and they get real lightsabers. Oh, <laughs> oh, well, that sounds, that sounds, that's, huh. Yeah, it actually has like a million views online. Um, did you say a million? Wow, for that and some without hiding it were really like, that sounds fucking stupid. Being made to feel like I had made a mistake. Being made to feel like I had done something wrong. Being made to feel like I shot shy of the net. When I could turn to my computer and there's people going, I love this, make more of this. And then I turn to the people who I need to keep going. And there was not a lot of enthusiasm. There was some enthusiasm. I do not blame anybody but myself for me not making more films or continuing to tell this story for my decisions to make something that was probably heavier than it needed to be, took longer than it needed to take, and probably sucked up a lot of the oxygen in the room in their lives for some years. I knew that I was going to make things whether anybody gave me permission to do it or not. And I had kind of found the weight that I wanted to punch. And I only know that now looking back on it. In the moment, I felt rudderless and like a miserable, disgusting failure. That's really where I was emotionally for the two years coming out of six was that I had screwed up. I didn't build a fan base. They're not all wearing little pins, you know, with my face on them. And I thought that was gross. And I don't, I didn't want to do that. I really felt like I had blown my shot at building something like that. And what I was facing was, okay, well, I'm going to have to make some things that make money now. That's a really hard period of time, but I was proud of six and I knew people enjoyed it. And there was a clamor for nine. And because there was not a, so when are we going to make it? And because I felt like I had blown the release of six, I I let it, I let it go and just kind of put it on the shelf and got going.
I don't brag about three and six. I don't bring it up in conversation. I don't offer a three and six in my daily life as I talk about my background and my experience, but I am by no means ashamed of it. In fact, quite the opposite. I try to be as full of gratitude as I know that I should be because for the most part, certainly overwhelmingly, the three and six audience have been lovely people who really get it. And no, you can't go to my IMDb and see a movie or a TV show. But what I do enjoy in my life was I had a hit song and I shared it with my friends and I was really glad to share it with my friends and I could not have done it without them. And I was grateful then and go on being extremely grateful. I would say that word over and over again, because that's how I'm supposed to carry around it because there is a, there is a weight to it. There's a sadness to it. There's a shadow to it of should I have done more? Should I have handled it differently? Should I, should I, should I, should I? To the fans of these movies, I would say that you have absolutely touched my life and I don't know how to process it. And I don't know how to hold on to or put my arms around your affection for these weird things I made in my 20s. Every few weeks, quieter every year, but never silent. It's gone from, hey, where's Diane in the evening to it reached a certain point of like, hey, what in the hell, man? And that kind of cooled off. And now we're in the nostalgia era of it where people DM me or message me or, or what have you and and say, hey, man, thank you. And it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful that people still think about it. And the fact that I wanted to do a cliffhanger at the end of six and that was not a popular idea. I'm glad I did it because it leaves you thinking about the possibilities of it. I count that as a victory. And I've had a huge guilty conscience over the fact that we weren't able to get nine off the ground. We got damn close more than once. It's similar to why there's other series that didn't get their third one for one reason or another. And I think that's part of the story of it is that there's this sort of thing that should be there that's not there and doesn't that kind of fit the theme of it and if and when i return to that story which i would really like to do i think a huge part of it is that there is this chapter that didn't get told i think the expectation of a million people having seen something the goalposts start to get moved around for what everybody's expectations of it are. It was tremendously gratifying that people connected with the story. It left me no further professionally. And so that notion of exploring narrative storytelling for fun and profit online began to fade away. And there's nothing I can say to people who DM me or make comments in various places online that's gonna live up to my gratitude for their care and their attention and their thoughts toward it. I hope that gives you something because that's, that's, that's my truth right there. In the end, everything turned out all right. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. All we wanted to do was keep our lightsabers, right? Travis? No, Corey. I just wanted my friends back. So in 2008, Corey and I started a production company together in East Texas, Happy Baby Productions, and we did a ton of work and we had a wonderful five years. We worked for everybody. We worked for Swan's Furniture and Don's TV and Appliances, and we did dentists in the city and the chamber. I'm a highly functional man, but what most people don't know about me is that thanks to my high-speed internet, I'm a level 60 warrior. With a flame burst longsword and a glimmering charm shield. Then we moved to Austin because we wanted to, badly, and we both got jobs. Part of the closest of friends, WebDM began, 
Hey there, Lovecraftians. I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. Then I'm doing a weekly 20 to 45 minute conversation between Pruitt and Jim. That goes for about five and a half years. And then in the midst of all of that, I'm a career videographer. I've been pretty busy. I've got, you know, a kid, one on the way, and you know, I'm busy making content all the time myself. I have a documentary series that I do monthly for UT's Alumni Association and side jobs and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, busy, busy. Move back to Austin, just continue to be a pharmacy tech and be a nerd and play D&D a lot until we started up WebDM. But yeah, I mean, it's a pretty low key existence. The odd, hey, you were in three in the afternoon, right? Like, yeah, that, that happened every now and again, you know, about every, I don't know, six, eight months, somebody would recognize me, especially like when I get down in Austin and like really nerdy places. So in 2011, I'm silently acknowledging that nine is a no-go. And then we get to Ace No Face, which we made while Happy Baby was up and swinging. We hatched this idea for Pruitt as an ex-Afghanistan war vet turned hitman. Does that sound familiar? Contract killing with this shady character with an eye patch. We've got a big Metal Gear thing going on in this. We needed a villain and Corey's like, well, can I be that diehard sort of Euro trash villain screaming and yelling? Can I put on a wig and just do something nuts? And of course he did. It's probably Corey's finest hour. Fuck you! Fuck you! You don't kill me! I kill you! <laughs> we put it together and then Happy Baby just kept going and the momentum to keep this story going kind of fizzled out. It's far and away the best thing we ever shot, and it is absolutely the last Fanboys production and our lost film. So we fast forward quite a few years after, uh, you know, Ryan vs. Dorkman 2, and I make a Ryan vs. Brandon 2. I'm kicking around with lightsaber fights and stuff like that, but really I've dedicated myself to the career of visual effects and have been spending uh, many years on television and films just sort of working my way up in terms of skill and competency and caliber of projects. I remember when RBD made Mark Hamill's list of top 10 favorite Star Wars fan films. Ryan vs. Dorkman. I'm going to give an additional nod here to TheForce.net for hosting the lightsaber choreography competition that ultimately pitted Ryan and Dorkman against one another. Without it, we might never have experienced this wonderful work of art. And some of you may be thinking, but Mark, what about Ryan vs. Dorkman too? Call me sentimental. I guess I just prefer the original. And then it was around that time or before that the Weezer video came out. Ryan and Mike are in that Weezer video for pork and beans. And I remember talking to Ryan on the phone and Ryan was like, oh, we're going to go be in this Weezer video. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. You have arrived, my friend. Ryan's always so cool about it. Oh, yeah, we're going to do a little roto, you know, and stuff. I'm like, you're going to do a little roto. And he would, you know, laugh warmly. I think I had the first lightsaber tutorial for After Effects, and a lot of people tell me that they use that thing to, to try to do it themselves. And uh, so, yeah, I think uh, I think I made a, a, a small contribution to the uh, the landscape of the time. When someone personally actually emails you back and says, "Hey, wow, I was really inspired by your thing," and that's the reason I got into visual effects myself, or that's the reason I picked up a camera and started making films, or that's the reason I decided to do this or that, to have had a tangible influence on people's lives going forward um, through something that that you just created because you wanted to is uh is super interesting and uh and yes certainly humbling right around when um force awakens was in post-production it just so happened that one of the opportunities that uh, i had heard about from a friend and that my agent had heard about was that the offices over at bad robot were housing a company called Kelvin Optical. They weren't, you know, the huge vendors, but they were just knocking out lots of visual effects work that needed to get done, which is super exciting. It's the first time that there would be visual effects work in town in Los Angeles, because, you know, up until that point, it was all 100% ILM. And so I, of course, immediately proceeded to apply there. And, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, there's nothing about Ryan Weber, Mr. Star Wars lightsaber guy, that uh, got me that job. It was purely my reel and resume and uh, my interview over there. 
So I popped in there and I started off with uh, just some relatively uh, straightforward shots, marker removals, some um, BB-8 rig removals, and then after a little while, finally started talking to this guy, uh, Andrew Kramer, <laughs> who I was uh, very familiar with. So Andrew was leading up a team doing graphics and hologram work. Andrew said, well, hey, you know, I'm sure they can roll you into my team and we can certainly use it if you're interested in doing something other than BB-8 rig removals. And I said, I'm perfectly fine doing BB-8 rig removals, thank you very much, but uh, I sure would enjoy helping you out do some holograms. No lightsabers. Nope, I have not done an actual lightsaber in a Star Wars movie. Nope, that's uh, still as yet to come, I guess. Waiting for the call by my phone every day, you know. <laughs> I'm hoping to get into my 40s and have made some room finally in my life as I start to calm things down around here on planet Trav and get the room to tell some stories again and just fucking around like I used to, you know, with the same heart for it and the same playfulness. He's mentioned to me, you know, throughout the years, off and on, you know, I've got an idea for this or I've got an idea for that. I don't know that we could ever pull the resources together. You know, I'm an editor by trade. That's what I do. It's my job. I, I edit commercials. Trav's a videographer. Pruitt is doing the pharmacy tech thing and he's traveling all over the country now. And Corey's got a family and, and there's so many moving parts that I just, I don't know if we could pull it all together to even like, even do a short. I just, I don't know if it would be feasible now. And I think the expectations, because we've had 20 years of being professional videographers, I don't know that we could shoot it in a way that would satisfy us. So, I, you know, maybe one day, never say never. Maybe one day we, we managed to pull it off and, and, and get everyone back together for, for one last hurrah, as they say, but We'll see. My husband loves these videos. When it gets brought up, he's like, have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen Gina in the little short film? And they're like, no. And then he immediately shows it off. It is always a conversation starter about, well, what would you do if you discovered a lightsaber? Like that's literally the next question that people talk about is like, oh man, what would I do if I had a lightsaber? How would I use it? almost made a video you know a dozen times where and it'll just be me down like Andy Kaufman eating a sandwich and I'll just spill all my BS about three and six and nine and beyond I'm much happier to speak to someone who is invested in this topic you know it's just it's just wonderful that anybody gives a shit can show the world everything from home movies to their own attempt at a Hollywood feature. YouTube.com has become incredibly popular in just the past year, hundreds of millions of hits. But KLTV7's Morgan Palmer speaks with a local filmmaker who has YouTube success about why he feels the site's days are numbered. It's been a real joy to get to share this with, share my film with people who are excited about it. The title is Three in the Afternoon, and right now it's playing on YouTube. Admission is free. A quick search of YouTube finds not only short films, but home videos of war, the conflict in the Middle East. With countless videos on YouTube and more going on every day, the one critical question is what happens when someone's copyrighted material is put online without their consent? Bowlesfield's movie and television company should see the thousands who have interest as a fan base to be cultivated but that immediate payoff has become the pressure. So long as companies see YouTube as stealing profits, Bull says YouTube's existence is threatened. A clip of a new movie is gonna come up and, uh, and YouTube's gonna get the pantsuit off of them 
and we're going to turn around and it's going to it's going to be gone. He says putting the brakes on the now raging creativity of filmmakers and normal people alike. Morgan Palmer, KLTV 7 News.